too handy or too handsome But I sure do like to play some When I can be the fool Lose the plot and lose my cool I lose my keys but not my conscience Tell me do you really want this Tell me why, 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 why you won't go I've tried, 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 tried. I've been trying to take it easy Take it easy but still take it Make it better if I break it Sometimes that gets hard A good Thursday morning to you Or Thursday afternoon or Thursday evening Or or maybe it's Saturday Or maybe it's September when you're going to hear this show Whenever it is, we welcome you to this July 8th edition of Real Talk. Ryan Jesperson here with you. Sarah Hoyle, Samuel Brooks with me in studio. Today is going to be a great show. It's going to move fast. We have a new feature that we're rolling out today, which I'm very excited about. I still have to find my tone for it. I have to find my tone. It's called, I'll just say the words. It's it's called eat your words, but you can't present it like that. But it, it, I'm thinking it's more like, eat your words, because you don't want it to be trash talk, which is tomorrow, as we know. We're accepting your emails, your trash talk submissions. I just got one. I just got one from, from Miranda, who's all kinds of fired up, like all caps, emojis, F-bombs everywhere. Miranda's all fired up. She wants to be considered. She is being considered for trash talk tomorrow talk at ryanjesperson.com but eat your words is coming up later on today i'm excited about that emily atkins going to join us an environmental reporter you may subscribe to her climate newsletter heated you may subscribe to her podcast by the same name emily's been writing on and commenting on this uh, remarkable bit of investigative journalism from the uh, unearthed outlet that's greenpeace out of the united kingdom they got these uh well, you know the story. Lobbyists on record, uh, Exxon lobbyists in particular, talking about how they've worked with American politicians, 11 senators in particular, and how they've swayed public opinion or, or if you will, gamed the conversation around climate change, things like carbon taxes. Should be a good conversation. That's coming up in just about 10 minutes' time. Ben Gould will join us today uh, from Serene View Ranch Psychological Services, uh, ben is a uh, band member of the Abiguit uh, First Nation on Micmac land in Prince Edward Island. Uh, he's going to be talking to us about how to talk to young people, how to talk to maybe your kids about residential schools. I think it's going to be a really interesting conversation. And later on the show today, we'll bring in Omar Mualam, a journalist, an author. He's got a book coming out, Praying to the West, How Muslims Shaped the Americas. We're going to talk to Omar about immigration. An interesting angle from a piece that he's written in the Globe and Mail on on what immigrants or refugees owe to their new country and vice versa. And he takes an interesting, as is the case with all great stories, Omar takes a very personal angle on this. And he tells the story through the lens of a couple people's individual walks. And Omar's been, I mean, recognized as a great storyteller for for many years. He's a recipient of of several awards for his journalism. And I'm looking forward to that conversation coming up about 90 minutes from now. Of course, we should probably note this is not a sports podcast per se, but in real talk, we talk about news, politics and pop culture. Sports can fit into there in the news and pop culture fronts, probably Unless you're talking to parents whose kids got cut from the hockey team, then it's nothing but politics. But news and pop culture would include last night the Tampa Bay Lightning doing what everybody expected them to do, which was beat the Montreal Canadiens. Les Habitants, amazing run to the Stanley Cup final. 
But the Tampa Bay Lightning have hoisted their third Stanley Cup. Andre Vasilevsky, the goaltender, doing it in remarkable fashion with a shutout. In fact, ending all four series in all the clinching games with shutouts, which is amazing. Winning the Conn Smythe Trophy. Uh, there you have it. What Con a run, Smythe. though. Conn Smythe is the most valuable player. Most valuable player for the playoffs. For the playoffs. Yeah, so a lot of people thought it might be Nikita. Well, pe- pe- people have different opinions, right? Some people thought it might be Nikita Kucherov because he, he he sat out for the season. Are you familiar with the whole background with, with everything? Why everyone's so pissed? Not everyone. Some people are really pissed off at the Tampa Bay Lightning because salary <laughs> cap doesn't count in the playoffs, right? Okay. So it doesn't matter. Players aren't getting play- paid in the playoffs. I don't even know how they're feeding their families. They're not even getting paid in the playoffs. <laughs> but they're poor they're guys. paid they're paid through the course of the regular season. And so they they uh the salary cap counts. It's like, you know, usually around 90 million ish. I think it's like 88 million or something like that. So Kucherov was hurt. And so were he to come back to the Tampa Bay roster during the regular season they would have had to make room for him Mm. and he's one of the elite stars in the game he's one of the game's elite scorers and he makes a lot of money so tampa held him out like he he wasn't healthy tampa held him out until the playoffs started and then kucherov came back having not played you know at least in front of uh you know at least in in the game context having not played for the entire season and lit the playoffs on fire led the nhl stanley cup playoffs in scoring did an amazing job and and played a huge role in tampa winning so people are going well tampa they cheated right they, they kept kucherov off the ice they cheated they did not cheat and the only reason that people are upset at tampa bay is because it's not their team that did it tampa that's, bay gamed the system but that's just like uh to bring it back to basketball because i always do in the first 10 seconds uh, yeah <laughs> That's like when they 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 hold players off the court just to make sure that they're you know load maintenance. They're making sure that. See, I don't know. This is where hockey fans cannot relate to basketball. Okay, fans. but but that you is think, like basketball fans think it's totally cool that Kawhi Leonard plays like one out of every five games just so he doesn't get too tired. I just can't even. It works though, as well, as it? the Lightning just showed, yeah. and bit of a stretch. <laughs> Bit of a stretch, but just don't pull your hamstring on that stretch. Okay, I uh, the thing that I found really interesting is like last night's game, no competition. I just was like, obviously the Tampa Lightning are Tampa Bay Lightning. Yeah, but 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 (laughs) you got that sense. Well, one nothing though. One nine. It it wasn't nine nothing. But you looked at the shots on net, and it was like yeah fifty percent. Yeah, kind of Montreal style though. That's the thing. That's what makes Carey Price so remarkable is that the Montreal Canadiens, it's not unusual in a game, you know, for whoever they're playing to have 35 shots and for the Habs to have like 11. That's just it's the way that they've played and 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 they've got a, a great back end, right? Former Edmonton Oilers, Jeff Petrie. They've got the legendary Shea Weber there on the blue line. Mikhail Sergachev, the Russian that came from Tampa Bay to go or came from Montreal rather to go to Tampa. In, in a deal that worked out better for Tampa than it did for Montreal. So, but, but to bring it back, so, so Vasilevsky wins the Conn Smythe, mm. which you, no one's going to take issue. I mean, he's, he's arguably the best goaltender in the game. Okay. Right? Carey Price would be in that conversation too. But Vasilevsky, I think, is probably seen by his peers as the best in the game. Um, the shutout to win, the shutouts to win every round. I mean, he's, you know, he's been unbelievable. Some people thought maybe Braden Point. Kid out of Calgary, actually, hmm. um, who who did an amazing job through the playoffs, went on a big goal scoring streak. Um, I think he's he's you know, maybe nine points behind Vas- or behind uh, Kucherov, something like that. So he was a little bit behind in the scoring. Some people thought maybe Braden Point. Some people thought maybe Kucherov. And then some people were saying, well, you know what, Carey Price, the goaltender for the for the Canadians, could have also legitimately won that Conn Smythe Trophy. It's mm-hmm. happened before. Jean-Sebastien Giguere won it, the goaltender for, for Anaheim. When they lost in the cup final, he won. Oh. Ron, Ron Hextall, goaltender for the Philadelphia Flyers, won when they lost in the Stanley Cup final. So you can win the Conn Smythe if you don't win the cup. It's rare, but it's not unprecedented. So Steven Stamkos, he's the captain, right? He, he skates over to Gary Bettman, the commissioner of the league, and he and he takes the Stanley Cup, and they do their photo, and then he and he hoists it, and it was exciting for everybody in Tampa, exciting for Stamkos because he didn't really play last year much. He was hurt. He came back. He scored a goal in the Stanley Cup playoffs. He gets his ring, wearing the cap, the captaincy, wearing the C, he hoists the cup, but but he didn't really play that much. So you know, internally for him, 
I bet when he was out with the boys on the boat at, at the cottage in Muskoka, they were probably grinding his gears a little bit. They'd never do it publicly, but probably a little bit. So Stamkos gets to come back and captain the team to a cup win, back-to-back. So that's pretty sweet, right? They get to do it in front of their fans. Remember, the cup was hoisted in Edmonton, Alberta last year in the bubble in front of nobody virtually, yeah. right? So it was a bit of a different experience for them. So Stamkos hands the cup over. To, it's always big. It's always a big speculation. It's always fun to see who will the captain hand the cup to first. Oh, really? That's a big thing. You look at Joe Sackick when he was hoisting. It wasn't his first cup, which is probably why he did it. But in Colorado, you remember Ray Bork came over. Sackick famously took the cup from Gary Bettman, did not lift it, and handed it to Bork, and Ray Bork lifted it. Like, that was a big moment. So these are always big. So people are like, who's, who's, who's Stamkos going to hand it to? We had a couple of guys were watching the game last night, and a few of the boys were going, he's going to hand it to Vasilevsky. A couple of, a couple of the other boys are going, now. Nah, nah, he's, he's probably going to hand it to Hedman, Victor Hedman, their big stud defenseman, which he did. I was like, I wonder if he'll hand it to Kucherov. Here's the thing. It goes like, it goes Stamkos to Hedman. Hedman, I think, to Alex Kalorn or somebody. And then, and, and then down the roster, down the line, down, 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 down. Kucherov. I was like, interesting. Very interesting. That did not register for me at all. I had no, like the, the maybe I'm so that's the politics. No, but that's the politics part you're talking about. Exactly. (laughs) And I wonder if this is kind of like, and, and, and maybe I'm reading way too much into this and I have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about. I'm not pretending like I'm an insider that I have any uh, insight. I'm not pretending like I have any insight into the locker room in Tampa or what may, what may be going on. But I had to wonder, is there like a bit of a thing? Mm. Is Nikita Kucherov, is, is there a bit of a thing? Now, he had this press conference after the game. I don't know if you've seen it, but just like he's, no. had, a, he's had a few wobbly pops. <laughs> he's already had a few. It is very clear. He's got his shirt off, which if I looked like a pro hockey player, I'd probably walk around with my shirt off everywhere too. You know, I'd be like the no shirt, no shoes, no service guy, just pushing the envelope all the time. I'd be like, I have an eight pack. What are you talking about? Put a shirt on and hide this. Come on. So he goes in and he starts saying he's dropping f bombs and he's doing the thing and all the and all the um, you know the journalists are having a laugh, having a chuckle, and then he takes this big swipe at Montreal Canadiens fans, which everybody's talking about. What did he say? Well, it was it, he 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 basically says so the Habs fans so Habs win game four as you know in Montreal yeah. to set, like to to avoid getting swept and Habs fans go nuts obviously they're super excited everybody was excited everybody gets to see more hockey whether you're cheering for the Habs or not so Kucherov goes on the record last night and basically says he goes and these he says and these Canadian fans he's like Pff. he goes like last game game four they treated that like they won the Stanley Cup he's like Pff, give me a break seriously he says. Their cup final was last round against Vegas. I was like, oh, we considered it for eat your words, but it didn't quite qualify because we've got something even better. Let's kick off the show. Our, the team at Bitcoin Well, our presenting sponsors, have been with us since day one. And over the course of the, uh, oh, geez, quick math. What is it? About seven months we've been doing the show ish, approximately. We've seen Bitcoin rise fall, rise, fall, and it's tough to sort of get a handle on exactly what's going on. Depending on what you're reading online, whether it's Bloomberg or Forbes or The Motley Fool, you're going to get different takes on what crypto is going to do in the next year. I have personally found through conversations with the team at Bitcoin Well that it's helped me make sense of it all and develop more of a bird's eye view of everything that's going on. If you're trying to make sense of it, but you're having a difficult time doing so, I would refer you to a conversation with the team at Bitcoin while you can find their contact information under the Sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. (laughs) I love this on the live chat. Nick just says, shots fired from Kucherov. That's right. They don't care now, though. Right? Like, none of the Tampa Bay light, like, they might just now maybe be going to sleep, but probably not. This kick starts now about, well, I would say a summer's worth of celebrating, but uh, yeah, I don't think that Kucherov's going to care one bit that people are pissed off at what he said. Kim says, Ryan, of all that hockey talk, I understood none of it. 
As a matter of fact, I understand Bitcoin better. That from Kim, who puts it into perspective. I love it. All right, let's get into this. Uh, Emily Atkin, an environmental reporter, joining us in just a moment. She's the founder of this daily climate newsletter, Heated, that I know many of you subscribe to, and she's the host of a podcast of the same name. We're going to be talking to Emily about an investigative uh, piece, a, a bit of journalism that, that's got I mean, it seems to me like people talking around the world right now. Uh, this is out of uh, Greenpeace's investigative outlet, Unearthed. They've been looking into big oil and private lobbying. And, and the journalist here that made this happen, he gets these guys on the record, including Exxon's senior lobbyist, Keith McCoy, who's, who's since apologized, by the way. He's he's hat in hand come to his partners. I saw something on his LinkedIn just going, uh, he said it was taken out of context, which is what they all say. He says, but still, I shouldn't have said the stuff that I did to Lawrence Carter. Before we check in with Emily, wanted to show you a bit of the video, just a portion to get you a sense of what is now on the record from the senior lobbyists representing Exxon. Here's a well, snippet. The winds are such that it would be difficult to to, to categorize them all. Did we join some of these shadow groups uh, to work against uh, some of the early efforts? Yes, that's true. Uh, but there's nothing there's nothing illegal about that. Yeah. Okay, so did we do this? Yes. There's nothing technically illegal. They're laying out their strategy. Emily Atkins has been paying close attention to this and joining us now live. Welcome to Real Talk. It's great to have you here. Hi, thanks for having me. I, I'm, I'm going to suspect that you're going to tell us that you weren't surprised to hear this from these lobbyists. I mean, I was surprised to hear them on the record, but I wasn't surprised to hear about the strategy. How about you? Oh, no, the strategy has been pretty clear for some time now, um, but it is sort of one of those saying the quiet part out loud moments where you're not supposed to say that. Um, and also, um, it was it was kind of nice, actually, to get confirmation of the stuff that I think a lot of activists and reporters uh, and even researchers have been saying for a long time, particularly that there's, there's this part in um, Keith McCoy's interview where he basically says that Exxon's entire support for a carbon tax, their public support for a carbon tax, is just based on the idea that they know that it's never going to pass so that so they can look like they're supporting a climate policy uh, that they know is never going to work. And so it makes them look good and then they never have to be regulated. And we've always known that, right? I mean, it, we've been saying it for a while, but it's just nice to, it's nice to get that validation. It's like someone finally telling you that they were wrong or like, I'm sorry after they, uh, after they like lied to you for a long time. Yeah. I, I try to, I, I know that I'm, I'm just, my sports metaphors just infuse themselves into almost every interview I do. I, I feel like it would be like Bill Belichick and Tom Brady admitting that they were deflating footballs back in the day. Everyone just wants to hear them say it. Everybody just knows it's it. probably true. Just say it. So what has this done, Emily? I mean, we'll dig into I, I, you know some of the spinoff effects here, but what has this done or how has this influenced a conversation that you've seen around environmental activism, around oil and gas, et cetera? It's hard to quantify at this point, especially since I'm just going to be frank, I haven't really seen it get the type of media coverage that I would if I were the editor in chief of, um, you know, a, a CNN, an NBC, the New York Times, it would have been front page news everywhere. Um, and it's just wasn't. Um, so I think that the effect that it has had, you know, it really did blow up on social media, at least it was covered by a lot of places. Um, I think that I think that it's starting to cement into the reality of a lot of people's minds the truth that climate change, the climate crisis that we're living through right now, wasn't inevitable. It wasn't something that was just going to happen. That these big weather events weren't acts of God. That this is actually climate change is something that's being done to us. It's not something that's just happening to us. And I think that that the more people that understand that fact, um, the closer we're going to get to solving the problem. Emily, do you think that, I mean, when, when it, you know, when we talk about, you know, Exxon, British Petroleum as well, BP w was uh, involved in this. I know that there will be conversations even closer to home. I mean, heck, we could talk about the province we're coming to you from in Alberta. We're, you know, we're under previous Premier Rachel Notley. We saw CEOs of big oil and gas companies standing with her up on the stage 
talking about her carbon plan, talking about her climate plan. And this piece and your piece uh, that I was reading and heated, uh, it reminded me of that exact same thing, right? Because the public is swayed or influenced when they see big oil CEOs standing with politicians talking about things like responsible climate action or pricing carbon. The public can be easily swayed. Does something like this, they do you think, that. resonate with the public? Uh, I I can't say for sure because I, I, I think that really it needs to be out there more. But what I can say is that you're absolutely correct on the power of uh, oil companies swaying public opinion to make people think that they're allies in the fight against climate change. Um, and you and I know that just because we see it in oil company internal documents, you know, over many years, researchers and journalists have uncovered internal documents from oil companies that basically say that the biggest key to continuing the cycle of profits is buying social license. Um, and so by social license, they mean the public's basically okay to continue operating. And how do they do that? Well, they have to make the public think that they are not destroying the planet, right? That they're actually helping, that they've turned a new leaf. And that's why you see so many oil company advertisements with like trees in them and lakes and they're at the airport and they're on TV and they're on social media. And they're like, you know, Chevron doing great. Awesome. You know, they're not, they're not trying to sell you a product. They're unlike any other type of marketing because they're not trying to sell you gas. They're trying to sell you Exxon. They're trying to sell you BP. And that is for a specific purpose that we already know, which is to buy the social license to operate. Um, so people don't know when you ask, like, is it is it going to change public opinion? It's tough because oil companies have been doing this since before I was born. Um, we've been fed oil company basically propaganda uh, for our entire living lot, lives. And it's only been the last few years that it's sort of been mainstreamed. The idea that these were manipulations of public opinion in order to continue to have the social right to pollute and destroy the planet for profit. Um, so, Emily, are we are, are you you're in D.C., right? Yes. Okay, so we're so we're in Edmonton right now, and uh, and I'm not sure. I, I'll probably have some references that maybe on your radar, may not. But one of the things that's really fascinated me from the first ten seconds that I read your piece and heated, um, and from the very beginning of our exposure, which was I guess about eight days ago now, when when Greenpeace, when Unearth released this this interview, these series of interviews, um, <clears throat> was was how the narrative has kind of been flipped on two fronts. In particular, you just talked about social license. Um, we've got uh, obviously a strong oil and gas economy or have had a strong oil and gas economy. A lot of people are, are hoping and believing that it'll rebound here. Alberta has, uh, here specifically, in Alberta. yeah, in Alberta. Yeah. It's definitely, uh, you know, driven a, a large part of the Canadian economy. And, and, and there's been big conversations around, for example, pipeline expansion across the country. And there's been a lot of talk about social license and social license for pipelines. And that has included conversations around, you know, consultation with indigenous groups and first nations and, and many other things, including environmental lobby groups, et cetera. I don't have to explain it to you. To hear you talking about oil companies getting social license here for bigger picture expansion is very interesting. What's also interesting, and I noted this yesterday on the show, is right now our Alberta government is funding, um, uh, I would say a highly controversial, but comical is probably a better word, a comical inquiry. It's known as the Allen inquiry right now. It's way over budget. It's way past its deadline. And this is essentially, I mean, what it is really is a, it. it's a, it's a witch hunt, but what it is, is it's, it's a government funded, it's a taxpayer funded investigation into lobby groups that are trying to stifle or trying to shut down Canadian oil and gas, Alberta oil and gas. And how interesting to see in this piece and, and this journalism that's been, that's been done by Lawrence Carter uh, with Unearth to see that the exact same things are happening with oil companies, that oil companies are working with shell groups, that oil companies are funding organizations that don't stipulate where the money's coming. I mean, this is the exact same thing, but flipped around. I mean, 
I've been very interested in Alberta politics for a while. I don't know if you know that. Uh, I went to uh, I went to Fort McMillan a couple McMurray, of years yeah. back. Mc, uh, McMurray, yeah. I don't even know. It's it's been so many years. Hey, but you went um, there. So like, I went there, but I almost got I almost got kicked out right before I even I flew into the Fort McMurray airport, the small airport, and I almost got. Uh, kicked out before of the country before I was even able to get in because, uh, you know, in the U S we call the oil sands, the tar sands, uh, and especially in, uh, you know, environment reporting circles, that's what we call it. And so I came off the plane and, um, these, you know, airport security guys asked me why I was there. And I said, I'm here to cover the tar sands. And they got so angry at me. They were like, we don't have tar here. We only have oil. And they detained me for, <laughs> Are you for a long time. Yeah. And they like threatened to send me back to the to uh, the US because I didn't have working papers to be there. You know, I was there for like, you know, five days or something, just doing some reporting. They're like, you need working papers, we're gonna have to send you back. And it was after that that I was like, wow, this was interesting. So I did this. Um, that was, you know, back in Stephen Harper's administration. And uh, so I did this, I started looking more into Alberta sort of culture and politics. And, you know, it's been something that I've talked about to my colleagues and readers for a while that, you know, Alberta itself is really, it's like the like Canada's Texas. Uh, and the government officials there, it really seems for a long time, I talked to a lot of like Canadian journalists for the story too. Um, and they were basically telling me that, you know, it's, it's really a, a microcosm of so much of oil controlled political culture around the world that Alberta is really um, where you should be looking at if you want to see what the oil industry strategy uh, is not just the oil industry itself, but your government. Um, and it sounds like that's happening. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I mean, I guess you're here because we want to hear from you, not because we want to hear from me. Uh, but I, <laughs> but I, I could go on for 45 minutes about how uh, big oil, uh, I mean, literally controls this government. Um, how big oil determines the budget, how big oil determines the spending. Um, you, you probably, it sounds to me like you're relatively aware of what goes on here. I mean, I mean, I'll, I called I'll, it Fort McMillan. So Fort McMillan. So we'll, we'll, we'll dock you two points there, but you're still at eight out of 10, Emily. So that's pretty good. Uh, you've been there, which is more than a lot of people can say. You actually went to check it out, which I think is pretty great. But I mean, to, to give you perspective, I mean, this is a government that that months before the American election last November, you know, bought into the tune of a billion and a half dollars, guaranteeing loans on another six billion on Keystone XL, betting on another Trump presidency. That's one example of. But, of but you're just you guys are just more obvious about it. It's the same in the United States. And it is it's just less obvious because we now have Democrats in control. But, and just because Biden canceled the Keystone XL pipeline doesn't mean that the entire US government isn't still basically controlled by fossil fuel inter interests. There's a reason why he hasn't gone as far to cancel like line three, uh, which is expanding tar sands uh, throughout the American Midwest. Um, and he hasn't gone as far to cancel Dakota Access. Um, we've got those Exxon tapes that we were just talking about, you know, that Exxon lobbyist said that they have 11 key U.S. senators that they lobby consistently to make sure that there aren't significant climate provisions in our big infrastructure bill that's going to be passed at some point. Um, and six of them were Democrats, right? A majority of those were Democrats. So they're not it's just less obvious here. You know, we've got the climate change party in control here, but they're still by and large, um, you know, if not controlled by at least doing the whims of the oil industry. Yeah. And there's, I mean, herein lies a, the potential for, I think a fascinating conversation and an important one and a relevant one about, I mean, if you're the president of the United States, um, canceling KXL is one thing, um, if you want to talk like line three, line five, Dakota access, et cetera, you've got to talk about other things like, 
you know, the United States. And now here I'm going to bounce all over. It'll be tough for you to pin me down because we've got to talk about things like energy security and the like, right? I mean, there there's justification, I think, right, Emily, for, for some of that. But what was what was striking to me here was the fact that so many Democrats were meeting on a regular basis, on a weekly basis with these Exxon lobbyists, because you're right, it probably blows the doors off a lot of conception that people had about what parties represent at a high level. Yeah. And I would say, first of all, I would say that you guys are lucky. You're still in a stage where uh, your oil controlled government leaders are very obvious about the fact that they're oil controlled and they just deny climate change and they just have their crazy reports that, you know, use millions of taxpayer dollars to investigate environmentalists because they think they're terrorists. You're like, wow, that's you're almost the next step of this where people get outraged about it and they take those people out of office. We are living that in the United States which is the next step of that, where it's not politically good here to be outspoken about the fact that you're bought by the oil industry, the fact that you're a climate designer. So they just say, as Democrats and Republicans, they just say like, I care. We really, we would never deny climate change. We would never launch an insane inquiry into environmentalists. Like we're definitely working to do something and they're just lying. So, and, the way that I put it on Twitter yesterday is that they're literally gaslighting the planet here. Um, and that's much harder to combat because a lot of people just believe what these people say because they like them. They're like, that's my senator. That's that's my guy, you know? So, um, and I guess the, the other thing I would add just on the energy security thing is it just came into my mind. Um, all these, all of these, politicians who say like we need these projects for energy security so that we are making homegrown energy here and not getting it from Saudi Arabia or whatever. Those are the same people that are making it extremely difficult to have energy security by having a diverse renewable energy economy. Um, they put they are the same people that have forced both of our countries to put all of our eggs in a fossil fuel basket. Uh, giving subsidies and benefits to fossil fuels while completely denying the same kind of um, benefits for a non less way less polluting renewable energy industry. They clamp down domestic energy production and then say, we need to fight for energy security. Um, but what they really mean is fossil fuel security. Um, and I would always think about what people are really saying when they say energy are you really saying energy or are you saying fossil fuels because for the most part i would say most people are yeah you know what that's fuels. a that's a, a really fair and important point uh emily it's it is i mean we, it's it's not lost on you i know i'm not telling you anything you don't already know but it's interesting to see big oil investing in things like solar farms, wind farms. We're seeing it here in Alberta. I know you're seeing it across the United States as well. I mean, I think that probably just from a corporate governance standpoint, that's a that's a the, the smart thing to do. I think it's an acknowledgement that ultimately that's where energy is going, right? And you even see rebranding of some some oil and gas companies to reflect the future of energy. Do you believe that 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 there's a sincerity there? I mean, you'd probably suggest, if I could be candid, around a boardroom table, if you're Exxon CEO, you're probably going to say, let's take everything out of the ground as much as we can until it's almost dry. But in the but in the meantime, you know, let's sell everything we can globally. Let's maximize our profits. That is our literally our only mandate. It's not Exxon's corporate mandate. I'm not saying this is fine. But it's not. Yeah, their, no, I'm just, but say, it's I'm not just saying it's not the boardroom. It's public. Like Exxon no, just but, says this publicly. But what I'm saying <laughs> is that around the boardroom, they're going to say, let's squeeze out every last drop we can and sell it for as much as we can. And in the meantime, let's make sure that the company's still around in the next hundred years. I mean, to me, that's probably the right corporate move. But it doesn't mean that oil and gas companies are going to, you know, there's this movement. People will say, you know, renowned activist in Canada, divisive one here in Alberta. I've had some great conversations with her, Sabora Berman. Zipporah Berman goes on on the record and says we should leave the, everything in the oil sands. We should leave the rest of it in the ground. We should leave it all in the ground. And it was like you would have, I mean, you would have expected that she declared war, right? I mean, that that comment sent these shock waves across the country. I have a hard time believing really? that any oil and gas company would reasonably Everyone take that position. Everyone says that here. <laughs> you hear it a lot. Literally, everybody says that here. <laughs> 
What do you mean? Like, give me a sense. In D.C., are you talking about policymakers? You're talking about journalists? You're talking about entrepreneurs, business people, shareholders? No, I mean, like, I mean, like climate activists and oh, well, climate sure. scientists. Sure. And I, I'm just like, how is that a controversial activist statement? I don't think it's, everybody says. No, I don't think she, I don't think she rattled any activists. But she sure, I mean, people treated it like like if you would take some of the language that was used from politicians in responding to what she had to say, um, it was like she tore up the Canadian flag <laughs> and stomped all over it. I mean, that's how she was treated for making the statement. Yeah, I mean, and that reflects a really, um, that reflects a miseducation widespread about the risks that climate change poses to Canada. Um, if if everyone thinks that not uh, mining and producing and it, the rest of the tar sands is an attack on Canada, then everyone is not educated on the attack that climate change is uh, is putting on Canada. You know, um, it's it reflects, I guess, national identity. Uh, we we have that. We have that issue here everywhere, especially uh, like culturally in, in our in Appalachia and coal country. Um, you know, coal and fossil fuels have done a lot for people. Um, they've given uh, livelihoods and uh, security to a lot of people that didn't have them before, and they feel very uh, proud of what they were able to accomplish and you know power the nation because of it. Um, it's all correct, right? Like for a long time, fossil fuels were really great. Uh, they did a lot of really great stuff for us. Nobody is denying that. But when you hear activists saying we got to keep it in the we got to keep the rest of this in the ground, it's not because they hate you, right? It's just because we came on new information that says that that these are going to kill us, and that all the stuff that they gave you is going to go away. Because it is. We know enough science to know that like all the benefits, wonderful things that fossil fuels have given us, they are going to eventually go away. Fossil fuels are going to take what they gave us away. It's just true. I, I, I've often heard it compared, I'm sure you have too, to, to people suggesting that this would be like the pushback from from people that would have uh sold you know whale fat or whale blubber back in the day and and you know back in the, you know when when electricity was coming online and available for street lamps maybe in london england i picture them happening first i don't know where the world's first street lamp went in maybe it was new york city anyway i would imagine people that were out whaling killing whales for their blubber were probably pretty pissed off about the move to electric street lamps that doesn't mean that it wasn't a good idea or that it wasn't necessary. Yeah, and I think people forget that the fossil fuel economy is not very old. Um, you know, like we haven't actually always been humans that have powered ourselves with fossil fuels. Um, like it's really not that old. It's like, you know, 100 or so years old. Um, and that we also have other ways to produce energy. Um, we need better batteries, right? We need, uh, you know, there's a big debate around nuclear. Um, that, but I think people often forget that when we talk about energy, it doesn't just mean fossil fuels. We have a ton of other ways to produce it. Um, and many, many scientists, uh, energy economists have published studies showing that it's more than possible for us across the world to do exact live exactly the same lives that we're living now, uh, just not with fossil fuels. Emily, what do you think just, ultimately? Like, what, innovation. What's what's the the reputational impact here of of this investigative report? Like, I mean, I, I know that some 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 outlets have covered it. Like, it was in the New York Times, and I know it was on MSNBC, and so, there was some coverage. Here we are talking about it, but do you, I mean, do you think that the average person's really gonna be surprised to hear? that oil and gas companies have been paying lobbyists to represent their best interests, which are not necessarily parallel with the best interests of the planet. I mean, it's like the whole thing about big tobacco knew about cancer causing agents for many years, yet they continue to sell cigarettes. I, I don't see anybody really picketing outside Philip Morris or anywhere else. Um, I mean, it's not like people aren't going to fill up their cars with gas. It's not like people aren't going to heat their homes, 
you know, in the, this coming winter. What do you think ultimately is the actual impact of this investigative report? I think that this investigative report is helping to cement in some more powerful people's minds um, the idea that this was this climate crisis is an injustice and a corruption story and about lies. And I think it's actually going to make and I've seen this just because I've gotten a lot of media interest myself over the, since the tapes have been released that more people at the top of like media organizations are like, let's talk about this. So you're saying, because they've known for a while, right? That, you know, Exxon's lobbying against it while uh, lobbying against climate policy while publicly saying they, uh, you know, they're cool with climate change. They want to help all of it. Like it's one thing to know that. And one thing to really know that that's, can I curse on here? Yeah. That's fucked up, right? <laughs> like, it's one thing to just hear that, you know, oil companies are doing their fucked up stuff. And then there's one thing to be like, you know what? That's fucked up. Like, it's the West is on fire. You know, like a whole town in British Columbia just burned to the ground. Hundreds of people across the West Coast of both of our countries just died from an extreme heat event that scientists were able to, in three weeks, put out a put out a study that said this was made 150 times more likely by climate change. And then you hear an Exxon guy saying, yeah, you know, we did we say that it wasn't real and join secret groups to uh, lobby against it? Yeah, but it wasn't illegal, right? Like we're just protect our shareholders. You're like, what about the fucking planet, dude. Like, I think that what this is going to do is make some people who are in journalistic positions be like, you know what? Fuck these guys. Let's do some stories. Right. And that's what we've needed for a long time, because this is a public relations battle. You see that all the time in Alberta with, with all of this battle for social license. So the more that uh, Exxon and other companies can't fool journalists anymore, um, I, I think that's what the impact of this is going to be. I hope more people cover it. Let me ask you this in closing. Uh, the lobbyists for ExxonMobil went on the record saying that they didn't believe there was any way to achieve electric cars for anybody. I know this is a whole new ball of wax. I'm opening up a whole new can of worms, whatever euphemism you want to use. Um, how accurate do you think it is? I don't. I, why would I trust any analysis that ExxonMobil has about the future of electric cars? when their entire motive is to keep the fossil fuel economy and to keep the gas economy going. I mean, this is the basic stuff that you learn in journalism class, but I feel like everyone should learn it, um, is that you don't listen to what people say, you listen to why they say it. Why would Exxon say that? They're just because like, he's like super, like why would Exxon's, you know, uh, representative say that? Because he's like just super invested in, in solving climate change and like just because his like independent unbiased analysis said that electric cars are never going to work. I don't think that that's why I think it's because if they do work, then his business is fucked. So <laughs> like don't why that's not a that's not a credible source. Go talk to a researcher. Go talk to an economist that isn't bought by an oil company. Right. Like and if you want, talk to one that's not bought by a uh, battery company or an EV company, right? Like, just get better information. Better information. The piece is a lie for a lie makes Exxon cry. And you can read it at heated.world. Heated is the environmental publication founded and put out by our guest, Emily Atkin, who hosts a podcast by the same name. We're grateful to have you here on the show. I'm looking forward to our next conversation already, Emily. Thanks for this. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you bet. She says what she thinks. That's the best kind of guest. <laughs> that is the best kind of guest. I loved it. I was fascinated to hear about her experience at the Fort McMurray Airport. Fort McMillan. Yeah, the Fort McMillan Airport. But hey, listen, I'm, I'm going to give Emily a ton of credit for showing up. She came and checked it out. She didn't just take pot shots from Washington, D.C. She came to check it out. No, absolutely. Um, and I just loved her... Uh, like candidness about right yeah. I, I didn't get it right but i showed up yeah and i almost got kicked out for it almost and got i kicked oh out. man and i just yeah the idea that i mean i i know what the 
the tar sands are. I know exactly what they are, but I have felt the pressure to refer to them as oil sands. Well, because you don't want to get your car keyed. Yeah. But yeah. just Alberta, how- Alberta used to advertise its tar sands for many years. Yes. Right. It was it was called the tar sands until the word tar became problematic optically. Then it became the oil sands. Yeah. Isn't it funny? It's like it was the tar sands for years, but it's now the oil sands. It was Dominion Day for a long time. Now it's Canada Day. Yeah. But the same people that would nail you to the cross for calling it tar sands still call it Dominion Day. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's interesting. It's almost like they kind of pick and choose the the elements of the golden era that they'd like to keep. (laughs) You know what I mean? It would be so convenient if we could keep celebrating Dominion Day. And if I'm not asking too much, can we pull the vote back from women? It's been so annoying, hasn't it? Having a campaign. It really, yeah. It's been so annoying. Uh, so if we could just get back to that. Hashtag women are delusional. Hashtag. I noticed that that stopped trending, by the way. Shocker. The other day, uh, which was great to hear that. Uh, and, and you'll have to have listened to Pasha's people tuning in right now for the first time. <laughs> what? Or, like some of Emily's fans that are joining us for the first time ever. Like, what the fuck is up with this guy? <laughs> women are delusional. What the hell is that all about? <laughs> What's that all about? Uh, but yeah, I was happy to see that that stopped trending in reference to our uh, comment the other day that women are no longer delusional, which is great news. And, and congratulations, women. That must be exciting for all of you out there. <laughs> oh, geez. Just stop. <laughs> stop. Stop. Mark has, uh, and, and this is why you add such a, an important element to this show, Sarah, is you, you actually, people don't know, um, we're like little kids that steal their parents' car. I'm working the gas. You're working the brakes. <laughs> So there you go. Uh, Mark has been chiming in and and Mark did the math for us. I said, what have we been on the air for for something like I think it was like something like seven months, you know, and and, and Mark says uh, he goes, yeah, you know what? He says, yes, seven big months. You know what I'm doing right now? He says seven inventive months. What a great word. He says, thanks to all the real talk sponsors for bringing this show and this format to us. And I love that he recognized our sponsors like Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge, uh, who have, by the way, on site. I better be careful because this was a couple weeks ago. Maybe they've sold it since they had the first Wrangler four by E at the St. Albert Dodge dealership, the electric Jeep Wrangler. And I'm sitting there just admiring it. I mean, the truth is I was kind of hoping they were going to say, Jess, but why don't you just take this for the summer? But nah, because everybody wants to see it, right? I mean, what I could do is just drive it all over the place. You know, we could do like shows from maybe the beach, like pull it up, have the Wrangler show parked. Sam could get us all set up in the sand. They're moving there. I mean, there's a day and there's going to be an an era when all the fleet trucks that are working in things like energy are all going to be driving EVs, these trucks, big ones too. Fascinating stuff. If you want to see what that 4xE is all about or check out some of the other rigs there, you're going to find better selection at St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge than you will anywhere else because they share their inventories and you can... Check those out online by following the Sponsors tab at RyanJesperson.com. That's St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge. The team at the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park want to remind you that at their six locations, Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, Westmount, Y Gardens, and Baseline Road, you can get two cheeseburgers for five bucks or two doubles for seven. An amazing deal. All you have to do when you pull up to that drive through window, or I guess you can walk in now, can't you? Everything's changed now. You can walk in now if you like. If you drop our name, my name, Real Talk, you let them know you're going to cash in on details, uh, deals rather every single time, and we'll bring you details on the next promotion next month. That's how they roll at the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. Also, a big shout out to the team at Kubi Energy. They present positive reflections. You want to talk about sustainable energy, the future of energy, energy security. It's what Jake and his team are all about. They've got teams right now across Western Canada, out of their offices in Kamloops and Edmonton, doing installations, commercial, residential, industrial. Every time I talk to Jake, he's got a new project on the go. He'll tell me about a really cool house that they just did, and then he'll tell me about a massive warehouse project that they just did, or solar farms, or these really neat things I don't want to actually get in too much about it. We're going to bring Jake on the show, and he's going to talk about how they're working with our presenting sponsor, Bitcoin Well, on ecologically friendly Bitcoin mining. Yeah, it's a fascinating story. You know, a lot of people crack on crypto, and it's a fair criticism. Yeah, precisely for that 
the, Farrakut, how they, hungry, energy hungry right? it is. How energy hungry it is. Yeah. Right? They say it's it's taking disproportionate amounts of it. It's taking crazy amounts of energy uh, to mine these coins. Well, so Adam O'Brien at Bitcoin Well, Jake Kubisky at Kubi Energy got together and they've got this project. I'm going to let them tell the story on the show. A reminder that you can find them online at kubienergy.ca. They're always hiring. Jake says they're accepting resumes 12 months of the year. And so even if they may not have a job open right now, if you're uh, an electrical apprentice or if you're a ticketed electrician, they are always growing their roster of installers. You can find more details at kubienergy.ca. We're going to get to some of your emails a little bit later on in the show. We've been hearing from a ton of healthcare workers. We've been hearing from a ton of nurses this week after Alberta's finance minister said it's time for them to take a pay cut. It was like the masks came off, the restaurants opened, and 72 hours later, it was time for the nurses to take a post-pandemic pay cut. And we've been hearing from a ton of you to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Keep those emails coming. Some of them are are, are a little more... Um, uh, um, I won't say placated because that's the wrong word. They're, they're, they're steady eddy type vibes. They're steady eddy type vibes where you could read the email in a normal voice. And then some of them are a little more trash talk esque. And so we'll be getting into a few of those tomorrow as well. We always invite you to stay in touch with us. Another, uh, I mean, uh, another theme that we found a lot, uh, and, and, it, and, and it makes perfect sense, of course. Uh, is is around the bigger conversation around reconciliation in Canada. We get these amazing emails. I got one last week uh, from Melinda who wrote in, and I remember it was a one sentence. She wrote to me directly, and she just said, can we please talk about how to talk about residential schools? And Sarah's been working on this interview for a while. It's a real pleasure as we discuss how to talk to kids or younger people about residential schools. Ben Gould is a, is a band member of the Abigrit of the Micmac land in Prince Edward Island. Uh, he's a doctoral candidate in clinical psychology out of the University of Saskatchewan. He works out of Serene View Ranch Psychological Services in beautiful Stratford, Prince Edward Island. Ben, it's an honor to welcome you to the show. Welcome to Real Talk, and thanks for being here. Oh, thank you, Ryan. I'm glad to be here. Ben, how do you? I want to. I want to make sure I do that right. How do you pronounce the name of your first nation? Abuwit. Abuwit. Okay, perfect. So this yeah. has been. Uh, I, I would imagine, obviously, every single Canadian, every single Indigenous person will have their own answer to the question of how they've been processing the information that that for some people has been known for a long time, and for some people, it's been a revelation over the past number of mm-hmm. weeks as a human being. Uh, and as an indigenous person or a person with indigenous heritage, how have you been processing it? It's one of those interesting things, Ryan. You know, it's tragedy. It's it's horrific to see and hear about these things that have been coming up with the mass burial. But the reality of it is, not surprised. Not surprised. We we didn't we didn't you know we weren't expecting things to come out as big as they've been coming out. But this idea that kids didn't make it home. We knew that. We knew, we knew that right from the beginning. And this is just one of those situations that's really, you know, that, that external validation of that proof and really bringing home that message. So, uh, My understanding is that your, your grandfather is a residential school survivor. Was, 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 was this something that was discussed in your family when you were a young man yourself? Uh, quite the opposite, actually. So, yeah, my grandfather was a residential school survivor from Shubenacadie, um, Nova Scotia Residential School. And quite the opposite, you know, when he came out of residential school, because of what he's been through, what he went through, we weren't connected to the culture, you know. It was a protective thing. It was, hey, I got in trouble for these types of things, for speaking my language or being involved in this. I'm not bringing that to my family. So it kind of went under the radar for us. And it wasn't until later on in our life we, we got those messages and this history will happen. So you have a son now, right? Or you're a dad now? Yeah. 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 So that's, I mean, I, I would imagine that, you know, you process everything in life, whether we're talking about this or anything else. Uh, I think that, you know, mm-hmm. people have their own lens um, whether you've lost somebody or whether you're a parent or whatever, we have things that, that impact us personally that will, of course, impact our worldview as well. Do you think being a dad has has influenced your thought process over the past month or so? Oh, oh, absolutely. I think it's 
was one of the driving forces to my reaction to everything. Um, being a parent puts things in perspective. You know, this idea, kids didn't make it home. You know, uh, my son going to daycare. What if he didn't make it home? You know, what if he didn't come home? That those are words to say now that that they're emotionally triggering. You know, absolutely, and it just really puts in perspective that there are thousands of kids that didn't make it home. So. Ben, people are, I was telling you about, we, we got this email. The, I don't, Melinda's jumped out at me, but we get a whole bunch of them from people saying, I, I want to learn more. I want to know more. I want to commend so many members of our viewing and listening audience that have told us that they've enrolled in this Indigenous Studies program at the University of Alberta, which is has, I, I feel yeah. like Emmy Award winning actor Dan Levy yeah. was the one that I think really, <laughs> when he when he committed to doing it, I think he got a lot of Canadians talking about it. That's an amazing step. We've got a lot of people in earnest writing in to say, I want to know how to talk about this, and in particular, how to talk about it with young people, including our kids. So where do we start? I mean, do I start by asking you how how how, how old is old enough? I mean, I, we know that kids as young yeah. as three died at residential schools seems to me like right around the same age, we could start at an age appropriate level, starting to talk about it. Oh, a hundred percent. And you know, it, it's, this, this goes back to the psychological and developmental milestones in kids. You know, there's one of the biggest things that we believe in, in terms of this, this reconciliation goal is awareness is communication is keeping things in light, you know, and letting the younger generations kind of have that opportunity to connect with that, understand that, in a healing way, it's so important, you know. Um, this experience with the mass burial is a driving force. It's a wake-up call. You know what? 2015, when the Truth, Truth and Reconciliation came out, that was a wake-up call too. And it was going well at first, but then it kind of tapered off, and it wasn't as engaged with. So we want to make sure that doesn't happen again. And so, yeah, there's things that you can start bringing up with kids as early as, you know, two to six. The type of things you bring up might differ. You know, for someone that's in their teens, um, absolutely. I think if uh, if I was to go into to, into it some more, that two to six range, they're very much nuclear family: mom, dad, dog, sister, brother. It's all about those things, and so they very much focus on that. And so there's language and words and understandings that might not be necessary at that age. You know, um, residential school, they don't really need to know necessarily the ins and outs of those schools, those processes, other things that happen. You know. Maybe they understand at a relational level, you know, just like there was relationships between people that weren't good, you know, kids did not have a good relationship with some of the teachers in that school, you know, um, the biggest thing with working with that age group is just making sure that they know they're safe. They're very literal. It's like, okay, crap, is this going to happen? It happened to me, you know, no, you're safe. It's okay. You know, giving them a sense that, you know, there was people out there that weren't treated fairly. You know, those very kind of general language kind of um, techniques can really allow the kid to start understanding and processing that in the safe way for themselves, you know, and really working with them at an emotional level. You know, they don't know what mental health, mental illness, those types of things. They know more about sad, happy, you know, things like that. Those are the kind of things you want to make sure that you're checking with them on and using in your language for sure. There's the the idea when when you talk about the nuclear family or you talk about, you know, young people's perceptions or understanding of the world around them. There's there's probably a basic understanding of what tradition is. Right. And maybe conversation about things like language, culture, spirituality at, a, at an entry level. I think five and six year olds start to understand tradition, which to me, um, I was telling our audience, we've been reading this book uh, to our little guy who's about to turn six called Stolen Words. And it's the story of a, a Cree grandfather and his and his granddaughter and the words that were stolen from him. And it's written in this wonderful way that I won't say that my our now five year old is, is able to, you know, uh, in detail explain, uh, you know, residential schools, but he can sure understand yeah. the idea of traditions being taken at an entry level. Oh, absolutely. And then, I mean, I think you, you raise a really good point too, right? Is when, when I, we list these age brackets and these groups are like, okay, there's seven, what should I, should not, shouldn't, shouldn't say to them. Developmental milestones are hit different times for different people. You know, these are general ideas, general guidelines. We recognize that. Kids, when you start to get into that five or six or that seven to 12, kind of into that tween age group, they do start to pick up on things more. They do start to collect and solidify information a little better, you know? And 
the other thing is they do start to engage outside the world a little more, you know, going to school, you know, daycare, things like that. They start to see things. They start to have more opportunity to access social media, you know, even the things that maybe they shouldn't be accessing, you know, word of mouth with friends and things like that. It's, it's really, it's really about recognizing where your kid is at, you know, what their triggers might be, you know, what they're used to hearing, kind of things they can and can't handle and finding out, you know, how to work at their level. So you're talking with your you know, five or six year old and um, that into that age range, five, six, seven to 12, you can actually check in with them. You know, you, you don't have to take so much pressure on yourself with this information. But what do you know? Where are you at with this? How do you feel about it? What did you hear? What are your thoughts? Ben, that next age group, um, you know, you talk about sort of three to six. Uh, that next age group is where I think we can start to infuse or we'll look to your expertise on what you think a age appropriate curriculum would look like the young learners, the six and seven year olds up to what, maybe 10 or 11 elementary school aged. What do you think is an appropriate approach? What do you think is an important approach? Yeah. So uh, an appropriate approach, I think again, is really coming down to how much information is too much and how much information is enough. I think it really comes down to the, the general notions of what's going on, you know? So for example, that age school kind of programming, you would be thinking about things and topics on the level of, you know, there were times in the history where people thought that darker skinned individuals were lesser than or not as good at, you know, you're not necessarily going into the specifics of the Indian act or the specifics of, you know, 60s schools, for example, but more so the idea of mistreatment and the general notions of assimilation, colonization, and what happened with that. And it's all about making sure that there's a safe space for that to be digested. You know, you're more so about comforting the individual and the client in that information and less about the detail, detail, detail. It's not until the teenage is when you can actually really kind of dive into those things. From my experience of working with kids, and it's more so about making sure they feel comfortable enough that they're not going to be embarrassed that they have questions they want to ask, that's fine. They have uncertainties. They're going to learn something in a very general form. How would you assess, I mean, we're talking about different age groups. As we get into that next group, I mean, now junior high school, um, you really start, you're, you're seeing obviously strong personalities have been exhibited for a while. You kind of get a sense when someone's 12, 13, 14, how, how they at, at, at least at an entry level, perceive the world around them, how they process information. By age 12 or 13, are, are you having candid conversations with young people about residential schools in the same way that adults might, you know, whether they're 21 or 81 years old? And again, you know, it's one of those vague ideas where it depends on the kid and where their development's at. Mm. You know, that, that's a place where you can really check in with them, you know. What did you hear? What are your thoughts on that? What are the questions you have on that? That critical thinking piece can start to find its way in there, depending on the kid. You know, if you find that they're asking questions, it's just very much like, oh, I heard that this happened and it wasn't fair. Okay, yeah, why do you think it wasn't fair? And, and doing those very surface level kind of conversations, they come in like, oh, by the way, 215 bodies were found in, in Kamloops, you know, because they were forced to go here for this reason. You're getting a little more in depth with the conversation. This kid has the opportunity to kind of take it a step ahead, you know. And so, really trying to figure out kind of where your kid's at and respecting that person and their safety in these types of conversations, while maintaining how important they are to have. How would you characterize how adults are doing on this? I mean, what, I mean, this is going to be an anecdotal observation. I'm asking you for your opinion on, on what you're seeing in the world around you. I mean, you referenced at the start of our conversation, uh, if you're just tuning in, if you're listening live on the Mixler audio app, we're talking to Ben Gould out of Serene View Ranch Psychological Services, Prince Edward Island. Um, you know, you say in 2015, there was, or there, at least there were the beginnings of a national conversation, and then it kind of tapered off. Um, I take a look at the Idle No More movement. It got people talking for a while, and, and then it kind of tapered off. I look at some of the railway blockades. Uh, got people talking across the country in a big way, tapered off. The Micmac, I mean, this is right in your, uh, this is right in your homeland, so to speak. I mean, the, the fishing disputes, there, there, there have been things, pipeline disputes, demonstrations on the West Coast that have got Canadians talking. And, and then 
human nature and the way that the news cycle works and everything else, we move on. I mean, a friend of mine said to me the other day, how many people, how many Canadians right now are talking about violence between Israelis and Palestinians? Like, nobody's talking about that right now because everybody's talking about residential schools. And the next time something big happens, then maybe nobody will talk about residential schools anymore. And the average person will want to say, well, I sure hope that's not the case. I mean, if this, you know, if the discovery of these unmarked graves has not been a wake up call, a permanent one to Canadians, then what will be? How would you assess how we're doing as a nation in talking about this? I am going to assess it just solely based on Atlantic Canada and Prince Edward Island for the area and relation I've been in. And right out of the gate, seems to be going very well in terms of how people are responding because that type of question, and I've had this conversation before from, um, from my province, you know, with my province about how do, what do we do, you know? And then that led to questions about kids. And this is an opportunity, even if you have a team to do these similar types of things, is really, really, really demonstrating some level of humility because I feel that a lot of people notice that this is a bad thing that happened, not fair, um, you know, hurtful, terrifying, so sad, but then it kind of stays there. And a lot of the time it stays there because people are uncomfortable to take it to that next level. Well, I don't know what to do. I don't know where, where my grounds are, where I'm, what I'm capable of doing, if I'm allowed to do anything. If we are able to find a way to demonstrate some level of humility, you know, which is an incredible indigenous value of, I don't know. I don't have all the answers. I'm not sure exactly what's going on, but I want to know. There's a level of respect there that people take, especially people from Mi'kmaq First Nations in my communities that we have people coming into our, our, our communities saying like, hey, we don't know what's going on. You know, wearing their orange shirts. We, uh, we did some ceremonies. They joined in with us. They experienced it. And that process alone was exactly what we were looking for in mm. that process. You think of the word of reconciliation, for example. Because I find people tend to be very solution focused. Okay, problem. Where's the solution? How do we solve this problem? Okay, you, you've already lost them. You know, uh, first of all, when this, for this to get solved, years. It's going to take years. We're more curious about the fact that this is a relationship that we're dealing with right now between groups of people that is not in a harmonizing, healthy way. And we need to find a way to do that. You know? So walk with us. We'll walk with you. Those types of ideas. Let's have humility for the situation. Let's have respect. And that's part of the process. And people here have been doing that. And I've been noticing that. I've seen that in social media as well. And it's about finding ways to harness that, encourage that, promote that, to keep going with that. It's uh, it's it's been really interesting. I'm keeping an eye on our live chat as best I can to see. You know, I mean, some people are saying you guys aren't giving young kids enough credit. They're saying that young kids are more than capable of having difficult conversations. Uh, Genevieve's watching right now. She says in Germany, you know, kids look, you know, they learn about the Holocaust very early. It's also marked all over their cities with plaques and information. Ben, how important do you think it is for young children to have a clear understanding of residential schools in the sense of or in the context of it shaping their understanding of Canada, shaping their understanding of indigenous communities and indigenous people, even shaping their understandings of the fallout, the effects of the generational effects of trauma. I mean, that's got it. Worldview starts getting shaped very early, right? Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's in, it's in those earlier years where the, the, the brain is developing at its most, you know, you see all these different kind of processes and lobes of the brain coming together. And it's the, the teenage years where the brain is most forming. Like, okay, you have this emotion regulation center. How do you actually use it? Um, I agree. I agree hundred percent with the viewers. You know, I think kids are quite capable, quite resilient. I've actually had people that we've talked to um, with kids that were victims of, of abuse and, Met the take home messages have been, you know, listen to the kid, respect the kid. They, they don't, you know. And for me, when I think about that and we think about the age groups that we've broken off, you know, that two to six, seven to 12 teens, the seven to six, that would be the great, you know, great time, a great age range to go in there with more of the information. What I'm thinking more so about is, you know, how do we give that to them while making sure that they have that space of safety? Because they have a lot of questions. They have a lot of uncertainties, you know, they have curiosities and we want to make sure they're in a place where they're comfortable talking about that because there's a lot of different opinions about this right now. There's some people that, you know, in terms of reconciliation, those types of ideas, they're like, well, this wasn't me. I wasn't part of this. So why are we pointing fingers at me? Why do I need to do something? You know? And so we want to make sure that 
They're given that opportunity to sit with this information in a safe way. Um, so 100%. I think they're very quite, you know, they're quite capable for any type of situation where they went on the web and all of a sudden they seen this ad 215, you know, that it wouldn't be something that would negatively impact them, you know, as much. Um, I lost your question there because I went a bit of a rant myself. But That's um, okay. That's totally fine. I just, I mean, ultimately what this comes down to, I think, is you and I having a conversation in front of a very engaged audience as well on, on what onus is on people in this country to discuss this. And, and ultimately, I, I guess, when it comes down to it, I mean, you know, there, I mean, there will probably be parents that, that'll say, I mean, ulti- I mean, there will be some parents that'll take issue probably with, these stories, I mean, I've, I've seen some people, although they seem to be voices, they're getting more and more quiet about how it wasn't all residential schools and there was some good. And I mean, some politicians have taken that position in years past. Do you believe that? I mean, is there an onus? Is there a responsibility? This, this may come come across. You may hesitate. You want to sound too judgmental here. But is there a Do people have a responsibility to discuss this? <laughs> I, I, I think that um, from my perspective on this, and one of the reasons why I think that a lot of this information gets kind of tossed to the wayside after so long with the tapered off kind of comment we had earlier, is because this gets treated as a dark time in history. Oh, there was this chapter in Canadian history where this all happened, you know. But it's not a chapter in history. It's an ongoing story that's continuing to really kind of keep happening now impacting people now in different ways, systematic levels in, you know, child care services, all those things, intergenerational trauma. And we as a nation and as a country on Turtle Island and this, this, this territory to really, we have an obligation together to find ways to maximize our lives for everyone, you know? And in this capacity, in this situation, it is. It is something that we have to do together because otherwise it falls onto one or two groups of people they don't have the means or are dealing with the, the brunt of that problem themselves and don't have that kind of external opportunity to contribute and lift up. And, and so, yeah, I think, I think we do all have an obligation for in this situation, just like in other um, things as well. Um, for example, I think some of the um, reconciliation commissions, I think one of them is passing through or it has passed through that um, people immigrating to Canada are agreeing to take this on, are agreeing that this is part of, part of what they're doing when they come here is to help with this process, this reconciliation. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we're going to be, as a matter of fact, that's a little kind of dovetail nicely, but we're going to be talking to author and journalist Omar Mualim um, coming up in about 20 minutes um, about new Canadians and what Canada owes to refugees and what refugees owe back. And, and I'll use this as a jumping off point. I'm curious to pick his brain on that. Um, ben, I want to thank you for, for making the time to join us and giving some tools to equip us, to help us understand this. Oftentimes we'll invite a guest to, to leave us with, with uh, you know, words to walk with or, or marching orders or an assignment or however you want to put it, a call to action. Um, if you were to do that for the audience that will hear this later on the podcast or those that will hear it live right now, what might it be? Yeah, calls to action. De- demonstrate humility. We don't, we don't have the answers. None of us do. I, I don't have all the answers. I'm part of Mi'kmaq First Nation. Right? I don't know what half these documents are, half these things happening, you know demonstrate that and you might feel more comfortable engaging with it you know there are communities in at least Atlantic Canada for sure that are more than welcome to embrace that respect that level and you know go on YouTube check out different documents TED talks on these types of things you know it, that that information that's out there is very powerful it gives a lot of perspective you know in terms of actual action you know if you feel up to it check check out the commissions check out the documents is there something there you feel like you could do contribute to you know People try to get lost in that solution-focused piece, but I think even that first stage of humility, respect, openness, communication is huge. And I think I really appreciate you inviting us for this, to this talk because it starts with the kids. It really does. It's, in my opinion, it's that generation that's going to build off of what's happening now. And it's so important for them to be involved and demonstrating their level of respect and where they're at with their life and what they can take in that moment is, is so important. And so I guess my biggest take home for the kids is just because you're not necessarily talking about the specifics of residential school, right? Or Indian agents or the treaties, if we place that, doesn't mean you're not still prepping that conversation and getting them in a space to think about it in that way and prepare for it. Well said. Uh, ben Gould, 
uh, doctoral candidate in clinical psychology from the University of Saskatchewan, joining us uh, from his workplace out of Serene View Ranch Psychological Services in beautiful Stratford, Prince Edward Island. Ben, thanks for this. Okay, Ryan. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. On the, on the live chat, um, I encourage you to keep the comments coming. I, I don't see all of them. I do my best to check in. I like this from Shalane, who says, I'm talking with my kids, but I'm also talking to their grandparents. Shalane says, I felt a strong need to push back on their old school narrative and not just letting them get away with their comments. That from Shalane, that's a really interesting and, and important point as well. Yeah, I mean, I was just looking at where my mom grew up uh, out in Killam, Alberta. And we were talking about, you know, she was saying, you know, we have our farmland, the farmland that I grew up on. And I was like, but who was there before? Who, who was there before? Mm-hmm. Th- there wasn't anybody. Mm-hmm. And I was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> they were taken off of the land, but who were they? And it, and it, uh, it was the Susit- Sutina. Sutina, yeah. Sutina uh, in Treaty 7. Yeah. And so I went to Nation Place as I, I believe the, the website, I'll have to look it up, but you can actually go and look at what the traditional lands were and, wow. and who was living there. So I, I took a screenshot and I sent it to my mom and, uh, and we just, we talked about Treaty 7 and we talked about um, who was there because the land wasn't just there for the taking. Um, so yeah, it's generational. There are, there are young generations, there are older generations um, that we can all be learning. I'm going to be curious to see how how land acknowledgements mm. um, come into play on a more regular basis. Uh, you know, it's uh, as a I'm a professional event host and I've hosted many events and 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 I can say again anecdotally, I always want to make sure that I use that word because these are all just these are personal you know, people's personal perception. This is what people see around them and observe. It doesn't necessarily provide scientific data for analysis, but I can say. That in in the late 2010s, like 2015, 2016, 2017, I started seeing more and more land acknowledgments written into MC scripts, right? Written into the official programs for big events, high profile events. And then they and then some of them started to taper off. You know, I remember one client in particular said to me, specified, we are not doing a land acknowledgement, um, whether that was how they perceived, you know, to be the most appropriate response, or maybe that it was political, or maybe it was something else. I don't know. But I would say that land acknowledgements might be one tangible and very noticeable and obvious, and let me say very doable thing, where it 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 carries on or even invites that exact type of conversation that you've just described with your mom. Mm-hmm. You know, like if, if you start talking about, you know, the, the Nakota people or the Salto or the Sutina or, or different, you know, the blood or like these different communities, these different First Nations, these people um, that invites quiet research mm-hmm. from people. I love I love thinking of that. I love I love the idea that people will listen to this podcast or they'll read uh, a piece that, you know, like, a, that, like that Omar's written that we're going to talk to him about in about 15 minutes. And then in the quiet of night, maybe when they can't sleep or, or, you know, maybe when they're, you know, waiting for a train to pass or something, they do a little bit of, you know, Googling, do a little bit of research and learn a little bit. I, I just flag when people say, you know, go do, go do your research. I'm always, I always say with reputable sources, <laughs> make sure that it's not just confirming your bias. Yeah. Um, it's, I mean, I did a, a blanket exercise, um, which is a really powerful, um, like it's experiential yeah. um, learning around, you know, what happened in Canada's history. And, um, and I, I was handed a card that said, you, uh, you die, you get, uh, you, you get a blanket <laughs> and it's infected with smallpox. Yeah. And I said, no, 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 I don't want it. I don't want this blanket. I don't <laughs> take it back. And I said, and I also said to the facilitator, that didn't actually happen, mm. right? That didn't, no, they didn't intentionally mm. introduce, in, introduce smallpox, smallpox into the communities. And so I had to do some reading on that. And, you know, there are differing opinions on that, if that actually was intentional or not. But the fact is, is that um, disease 
you know, was introduced to these communities that they had their bodies had never experienced. And what's before. important is that we're shining light on it and having yeah. these conversations and 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 um, uh, refusing to allow ourselves to continue um, in in relative ignorance about things that were that are number one extremely important and relevant, and number two not from a thousand years ago. Yeah, I'm not talking about Genghis Khan or something like that. I mean, this is I mean that's for grade two curriculum. That's for kids reading about the Silk Road. But the thing that I I really wonder about is this idea of land acknowledgements. I know people have pushed back, not just like saying, ah, you're just trying to be it's virtue signal. Yeah. Um, and so I think some of the challenge around that and some things that, you know, we are being pushed is, okay, so how do you then put that into action? And um, yeah, so I, <laughs> So sometimes it's like maybe there is an activity that comes along with a land acknowledgement. So how do you say, how do you pronounce like maybe a ward that you're in if you're in Edmonton or what is the First Nation and and actually, you know, taking that action or maybe maybe it's unpacking one of the calls from the TRC. Yeah. So not just, you know. Doing something like it's rote and it's you know, oh so we say this is Treaty Six is the blah blah blah, blah. like because it can be, it can just wash over people so it's about taking that taking that piece and putting it into action or or interpreting it or yeah helping people to process yeah Lala's as on the live chat says it's maybe time to move past doing what is the easiest and cheapest thing that makes us feel like we're woke. <laughs> which is good. I like that. We talk about inflicting discomfort, which is kind of one of our mandates for the show. It's a weird way to advertise a show, really. You know, come come, come get feel. uncomfortable yeah, with us. Yeah, we've 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 thought about billboards that'll just say uncomfortable conversations, but it's not really a draw, is it? You've got to sign. You got to sign up for it, right? But I appreciate that comment from from Lalazaz. I mean, people talking about the land back movement, which is one that obviously we'll be discussing on the show and talking about and looking into and what does it mean and how do people feel about it? And and, and by the way, you know, this show is not ever designed. This community is not uh, intended to be uh, some sort of a gathering where everybody agrees on everything and gathers to confirm our own bias and to pump our tires. And to, we want to disagree on things we want to ask tough questions that we don't know the answers to we want to explore uh you know ground and feelings and 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 perceptions that maybe are unfamiliar to us i don't think that chris henderson would mind me putting him on the record here he's the chief strategist at y station we were talking the other day and, and just candidly as pals and about reconciliation what it looks like and how we're processing this and in particular, we were talking about real talk, and there are official research and strategy partners, as you know, Y Station presenting our Get Real Question of the Week every week. And Chris said, you know, an idea that he's been kicking around and, and something he's been talking about with his friends, and this would be dramatic. Uh, in other words, what I mean is it would be significant. He said, I think that we should uh, basically blow up the Senate, not literally. I think we should let me be careful. Uh, but he said, he said, blow it up. And appoint Canadian senators from only indigenous backgrounds. I mean, if you look at what the role of the Senate is, the Senate is to either thumbs up or thumbs down on legislation. I'm oversimplifying what the Senate does, but that's essentially what it does. Mm. Legislation goes through the House of Commons and then it goes through the Senate. And he thought that that would be one way that Canada could take meaningful strides on reconciliation. That's one idea from one person. Now, that would be dramatic, obviously. Uh, in significant. This, I liked your word significant. But yeah, I mean, it, but it would it would be something that would be discussed the world uh, over. But, uh, you know, that's one idea. Now, someone's going to say that's idiotic and it wouldn't work because of this. And what are you going to do about that? And how do you reconcile this? And it doesn't fit with that. But it's an idea. Mm -hmm. And it's something that people are talking about in, in wanting to make meaningful strides toward reconciliation and i appreciate as well ben reiterating what almost every guest has said to us most especially you know exactly what i'm going to say everyone's trying to solve the problem everyone wants to know how to fix it and we want to fix it as quickly as possible right and uh and ben says it's going to take years and right now the assignment is to listen and i appreciated that from him we wanted to remind you 
This is a call out to photographers. The team at McBain Camera through the month of July, and you can read more at McBainCamera.com, is presenting their trade-in event. Now check this out. You can receive a bonus 25% value for your photo equipment trade-ins at McBain Camera locations across the province. This is your opportunity to turn your old equipment into new possibilities with McBain. They buy back or trade in everything from the vintage gear to the latest technology. They've been buying and selling and trading cameras since 1949. So you know you can count on a fair appraisal. They've got a lot of return customers here. A 25% bonus in trade-in value for your second-hand gear through the month of July. So how do you do it? Well, you bring in your used gear, cameras, lenses, etc. to any McBain location. You can find them all at McBainCamera.com. To have it appraised, you can give them a few days to test it, to assess it. And then, of course... I mean, I'm going to tell you what you're really going to do. You trade in all your own gear. You don't take the cash and put it on an RSP. You buy something new for your camera Ooh. bag. That's what you do. You trade in the old stuff and you upgrade. That's what you do. And if you're going to do it, make sure you do it at McBain Camera. Wanted to give a shout out to the team at Local Waste. You know, garbage math. They love doing garbage math. What is that? Well, it's the newest trend in curriculum. Not really. Not really. It's these massive, complicated, and, and, and liquidated damages costs from breaking waste contracts that people get nervous about, right? Small business owners, you're in a bad deal with your waste management provider, whoever it is, but you know that if you're going to try to get out of this contract, they are going to put you through the ringer. Well, here's where local waste comes in. They commit their resources to getting you out of your bad contract so you can move forward with a relationship built on integrity. You can find them online at localwaste.ca. And this is the call to you, Real Talkers. Tomorrow, Local Waste presents Trash Talk. We want to see your emails to talk at ryanjesperson.com. What is ticking you off? We want it. Pull no punches, as if I need to tell you that. While you're online, check out powered.ca. We're talking about online learning, learning on demand, bettering yourself, broadening your skill sets, in demand, on demand is Power Ed by Athabasca University. They're assisting organizations to develop and deploy their own digital learning strategies. They're also doing it at an individual level. So whether it's digital wellness, whether it's allyship and inclusion, whether it's AI, artificial intelligence and machine learning, there's a course for you. Some of them, you can complete them in two or three hours. I mean, dedicate an afternoon to it and gain new certification at powered.ca. Many of you have been in touch with the show, as I mentioned, around uh, Alberta's finance minister, Travis Taves, floating the idea of a pay cut for nurses. Now, anybody that's been paying attention has known that this was coming, and it's been coming for a while, right? I mean, the, the Alberta government came in on a mandate to get, get the economy sorted out and to, and, and to get that budget under balance and based on the ideology of the party the ideology of the premier most people with half a clue have said doctors nurses teachers and other public servants better buckle up because there's going to be labor wars as part of this well just a couple of days ago the finance minister suggesting that it's time Alberta's nurses take a 3% pay cut. Some advocates have said it's actually going to work out to more than that because there are other implications with what they expect to be coming down the pike, but it's prompted a lot of you to get in touch with us, including Marie, who sent us this email just yesterday morning. Marie says, Ryan, I'm a, I'm a registered nurse in RN, and, I, and, and I'm in my 43rd year of nursing in Alberta. Marie, thank you for that. She says, I've never, ever felt more attacked or unvalued as a nurse in my entire career. She says, I survived the, the Ralph Klein era, and I thought I'd never see that kind of disrespect again. The attack from this government on health care is apocalyptic. Nurses have been working flat out for years now. Their working conditions have deteriorated for many years. And now nurses are being denied earned vacation. They're being denied personal leave days for emergent family issues, sick time, and many other things. She said, do you think real talkers are aware that Ontario is currently offering large bonuses to move there and work? She says, if you're a critical care nurse, we're talking to the tune of $75,000 as a bonus to move and work. 
She says, Ryan, do you remember all those ICU nurses working under incredibly tough conditions during the peak of COVID, risking their own health? They could go to Ontario now and get a pretty tidy bonus. So what's wrong with this picture? She says, our nurses union has been trying to negotiate and bargain in good faith for going on two years now, and they've been pushed away repeatedly by Alberta Health Services. Bargaining dates have been canceled on the regular For the United Conservatives to claim that the UNA, the Nurses Union, is bargaining in bad faith, Marie says, I wanted to go on the record and say that that's an outright lie. She says, I could show you proposals for the bargaining. I could show you Alberta Health Service's response to over 200 proposed rollbacks. She says, some of these proposals will take us back to the 1980s in regards to our collective agreement. Keep in mind, Marie was working in the 1980s. That's her reference. She says the true story has never been accurately shared with the public. And it's about time that the general public stood up and fought loudly for their own health care. Marie says, now I'm lucky. She says, I'm retiring at the end of September, but my fellow nurses are not so lucky. They're fleeing the province and the, and the profession. And soon we're going to have problems when it comes to staffing as more and more baby boomers retire. Rural health care is suffering already, and it will only get worse. She says, I want real talkers to think about that. The next time they go camping or holidaying in the backcountry, rural facilities have been there to look after your health and your well-being, to treat your injuries for many years. Marie says, I've worked in the Fort McLeod emergency room, the ER there, and I've seen injuries come in. It would be a crime to see these services stopped. How many rural facilities are already closing because they can't even staff shifts with nurses, let alone doctors, all because of the attack on health care by this government? Marie says, I could write a book on this, but I don't want to take up all your time. She says, please ask real talkers to get out there and to actively fight for health care in the province of Alberta. We cannot let the United Conservative Party kill public health care. Once it's gone, we will never get it back. That from Marie, who signs off as a proud RN and a proud United Nurses of Alberta member. That from Marie. Greatly appreciate it. You can send us an email anytime to talk at ryanjesperson.com. That's also where we're going to invite you to submit videos or quotes for consideration. It's a brand new promotion presented by Prairie Catering called Eat Your Words. Just yesterday, the Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, down in Calgary to make a billion and a half dollar transit announcement. That's when a reporter asked the PM about Premier Jason Kenney's planned referendum on equalization. You remember Jason Kenney saying it's not fair for Alberta. And here's what the Prime Minister had to say. The concerns that Premier Kenney has highlighted on equalization... He was part of the very government that negotiated and put in place the actual equalization formula that is there now. When came time for renewal, we just rolled over the very things that he had negotiated as part of Stephen Harper's cabinet. So the fact that he's now railing against it means he can probably explain better what it is that he disagrees with his younger self on. (laughs) What he disagrees with his younger self on. You can see Calgary's mayor, Nahed Nenshi, just smirking behind that mask, can't you? I mean, that is shade. Well, here's what the World Wide Web had to say about it. We were keeping an eye on your tweets yesterday. Sammy Samsonite says, what's that saying, Premier? For someone who hates socialism, you sure do love being publicly owned. What about this tweet from Chris Anderson, Speak of the Devil? It's the younger self comment that really makes it art. This from Steve, who says, if there is a political version of getting posterized, this is it. That's Trudeau dunking on Kenny. And this from Amy, who says, I've never been a big Justin Trudeau fan, but this was a very pointed and accurate depiction of what's happening with equalization here in Canada. So, Premier Jason Kenny, on behalf of the Prime Minister yesterday, we invite you to eat your words prairie catering wants to let you know that they offer corporate catering for office meetings in person or virtual and they deliver 
You can host your business meetings and conferences at the stunningly beautiful Art Gallery of Alberta. And they're offering 20% off any rental space, any space, at the Art Gallery of Alberta for your next corporate function if you mention Eat Your Words on Real Talk. That's valid for 2021 rental dates. Eat Your Words, presented by Prairie Catering. Well, I'm very excited to welcome this next guest to the program. He is an award-winning journalist. He's an author, a book coming out in September, as a matter of fact, Praying to the West, How Muslims Shaped the Americas. He's written a great piece that's getting a lot of people talking in the Globe and Mail, published on June 26th, The Gratitude Gap. What does Canada owe refugees and what do they owe us? What a pleasure to welcome to the program, Omar Mualim. A good morning to you. Welcome back. Good morning, Ryan. Welcome back. This is my first time, sir, it's, on this show. I know. And you and I, I feel like I, I don't know how many interviews we've done over we the go, years. Probably 25. Yeah. <laughs> but it's On uh, various other networks and various other shows. Yeah, various networks, various shows, and always captivating conversation. Um, Omar, we've... Uh, We've um, got a lot to talk about. I want to ask you about you know, the, the uh, amazing piece, the powerful piece that you wrote in The Globe, and I sure want to talk to you about your new book coming out. But I just had a great conversation um, with Ben Gould. Uh, he's a, a psychologist practicing out of Prince Edward Island. We're talking about reconciliation and conversations on residential schools, especially on how to have those conversations with young kids. And he made an interesting comment, and I promised to him that I'd bring this up to you because I think it's a, it, it's a nice introduction. It's almost a segue into our conversation. He talked about how new Canadians are, are signing up, so to speak. New Canadians are making commitments to learn more about the history of residential schools, to understand more about Canada's history and colonialism and the story of First Nations communities and what reconciliation might look like. Uh, do you see that? I mean, I know that it, it, through the course of, of, of your journalistic work and in putting this book together, what have you seen from relatively new Canadians? Or do you note any difference in how they are processing this news? Yeah, I mean, I, I've seen it in, in my family, which aren't I mean, they're not new Canadians per se. They they are immigrants, but they've been here for, for decades. And, you know, we grew up in uh, in the High Prairie region um, with surrounded by, you know, it, indigenous communities and our family restaurant served a lot of indigenous communities. And there was still sort of a, uh, a gap in understanding and knowledge um, between, you know, what the history of um, indigenous genocide is and what uh, folks like my parents know. Now I'm starting to see people like my parents start to, um, you know, start to learn about this history. And it makes sense, right? Because they didn't go to schools in Canada. Not that, you know, Canadian schools or Alberta schools are just uh, so great at teaching this, uh, teaching the history of residential schools. But they got, you know, they got their history lessons from basically the citizenship test, which is like 68 pages. I don't know what it was in the 70s and 80s. And at, I think right now it only has maybe a, a paragraph or two about this. Um, so really, they, I mean, they can only learn what uh, they can only learn this history through through some accessible means, um, especially working class, you know, immigrants. And and that is really we're talking about mainstream media. And now that mainstream media is really sincerely making an effort, I think, to, uh, you know, to communicate this history and to better understand this history and elevate Indigenous voices uh, and their testimonies to residential schools, I'm, I'm seeing that transfer over to the immigrant community that I'm a part of, to the, to the Lebanese Muslim community. What, what prompted your piece in, in the Globe? About, about what refugees owe Canada, what Canada owes refugees. Uh, I'd heard that sure. you'd been actually working on this for a couple of years. I have been, yeah. I mean, there, there's a couple of things, um, really. I mean, to start, there was there, there was a, a viral uh, article or, or an instance that happened, I think, in Toronto where a Syrian, popular Syrian restaurant had shut down under harassment and it was being harassed and threatened because uh, one of the family members that owns it had participated in sort of a far left controversial protest, uh, you know, intimidating. Um, I think it was uh, uh, conservating or uh, intimidating a, a Maxime people out of Maxime Bernier uh, town hall. And, um, you know, that the that 
reaction to this person was one that I calling him an ingrate. Um, and basically like, you know, if you, if you don't, if, if you don't exhibit these Canadian values of, of uh, absolute free speech and stuff, you don't deserve to be here. And, and that word ingrate stuck out to me because I'd seen that, I'd seen that label and even heard that label used toward immigrants and refugees before. Um, another thing that inspired this piece is a, a few years ago, the first time that I'd um, reported on, uh, uh, reported a, a story that involved some uh, some refugees. I met this, this Syrian refugee, he had a bed bug problem. My story wasn't really about that, but I promised that I would pass this on to another reporter for the paper that I worked for. Sure enough, they sent someone out, they did the story about this refugee family that was having a problem getting rid of bed bugs, didn't know what to do. And the story came out and I was shocked by the reaction to it, which was, again, people calling them ingrates, basically saying, oh, you got a bed bug problem. Well, would you rather be in Syria? I mean, would you rather be in your bombed out village? Um, that that sort of clickbaity thing like refugee, what do we owe refugees or what do refugees owe us? I wanted to take this very clickbaity headline, something from that sort of exists in the in the domain of the comment section, and actually take it really, really seriously and look at the policies and the philosophies um, that surround refugee resettlement and see if maybe there is an answer there. Maybe we can come uh, come to some sort of pact between uh, what is owed to refugees and what are sort of the you know, the the terms of refugeehood in a, in a host nation. When you become a new Canadian, you take an oath of citizenship. But when you're not a Canadian, when you're sort of in that limbo, you're an asylum speaker, a resettled refugee with permanent residence, there is no oath of refugeehood. So what is it? What are the terms of living here? Do you get the sense that, I mean, the whole idea of, you know, uh, you know, would you rather be back in your bombed out shelter? Or would you rather be in a, you know, in some some sort of a, a refugee village or would you rather be or, or maybe you should go home or these types of sentiments through the course of I mean, you have this great balance, Omar, and, and, and you, you oftentimes will infuse this wonderful, almost first person perspective into your writing and into your analysis based on what you see and based on what you learned through the course of conducting these interviews, do you think that that's a, a so-called mainstream, even if subtle, a mainstream perspective? Do you think that's a commonly held perspective by the, can I put it this way, Canadians that were born here? Yeah, it is. Um, you know, and the, the support for, uh, for refugee programs and just, you know, in general, um, refugee resettlement has ac actually declined in the last few years. It was at a really high mark in 2015 following the very tragic um, photo of uh, Alan Kurdi, the three-year-old boy who had died and wa his body washed up on a, on a shore in Greece. But it's declined since. Um, and also, I mean, there, there is, it's interesting. I mean, most, by and large, most Canadians agree, multiculturalism, core to our national identity. Uh, and they agree that immigrants are good for the economy. Um, where you start to see this polarization is on the specific question of refugees. And, and Environics did a, a, a poll, I think, in 2019. And they found that it was not just a, a very remarkably steady hot button topic for the last decade in Canadian politics, but also that almost an equal number of people are, you know, strongly for or against, you know, resettlement of, of refugees. Uh, equal number of people are, uh, believe that refugees are legitimate and an equal number of people think that refugees are illegitimate uh, immigrants. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, look, they, they say, don't look, you know, don't pay attention to the comment section. Um, but I, I think sometimes you have to, because there is in a country like Canada, uh, a lot of pressure, maybe not to say these things out loud, but I think a lot of people exhibit these feelings that, you know, ref allowing refugees into our country is purely an act, an altruistic act. It is purely a charitable thing. And once they are here, they have to follow our rules, adopt our values, and they they, they don't have the right to complain because the alternative is so much worse for them.
And, and that's sort of what I meant by, by the gratitude gap, is that there's this expectation of gratitude for, of, from refugees just for letting them be here. But as I, as I sort of pried into this a little bit more, I found that there's another way to look at it. And, and this is much more controversial, but it makes sense. We can also look at it as a question of reparations, right? That there is, that they are not, um, you know, collateral damage in uh, events of extreme weather that have displaced them or war or uh, persecution against minority that's forced them to, to flee for their lives. Um, that it is a matter that they are victims of an injustice and therefore it is uh, the responsibility of host nations, whether or not they are directly involved in it, it is our responsibility to give redress for that. That's another way to look at it. I don't know how to ask the next question, uh, but you and I have always just kind of been no bullshit. So I'll just throw it out there. Like, you know, you see examples where, uh, you know, a, a Syrian individual or a, a, a Somali, uh, you know, uh, refugee or so, someone from and they're typically visible minorities, too. Um, I don't see a lot of people bitching and complaining about people that have that have come here from, you know, New Zealand uh, or that have moved here or from the United from States England of America, or the United <laughs> States of America. But you get you'll get in the, uh, you know, a story in the news about someone that's that's accused of a crime or that has committed or, or been convicted of a crime, yeah. and people will then apply some sort of a, an assertion about an entire nation or an entire group of people with this as the evidence as to why they sure. should not be allowed in the country, right? Yeah, well, and, but, and, and yeah. I mean, I mean those, those are the things that make headlines, right? You don't, you're not going to get a headline about, you know, the... Somali refugee family that, um, you know, volunteers at their local community league or something like that, or the, you know, the, the little Somali girl who sold the most, uh, you know, girl guide cookies or something like that. That's not, that's not a headline. Right. Um, so I mean, what, what can you, what can you say about that? I, I try not to fault people for their, prejudices the the fact that the, the color of, of refugeehood is brown and black um, is not like it's it's not a coincidence. I mean, there's 80 million displaced people in the world and the vast, 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 vast majority of them, something like 85 percent uh, live in the global south. And uh, and, you know, they are black and brown people and they mostly remain in the global south as well. Um, so, I mean, it makes sense that people on this very, very deep level associate uh, racialized people with um, with refugees, and then when when racialized people uh, commit crimes, especially you know something something heinous like the um, you know the ISIS inspired attack that happened here in Edmonton, actually just a few blocks from from my house here, which was a uh, a man who was a Somali refugee, a young man who was a Somali refugee. Um, you know, I, I understand why people have that kind of uh, reaction and why they're threatened by it as well. I mean, their culture is, you know, di- different from ours or more different from ours than, say, someone from New Zealand. Um, but I think, I mean, this is where the it becomes the responsibility of the media, um, the media, <laughs> mm-hmm. responsibility of media um, to take great care with telling those stories and to make sure that, you know, if you are going to make a point of someone being um, a refugee or an asylum seeker, like it better be relevant to the story. Otherwise, are you doing anything other than just trying to uh, rev people up? I really enjoyed you sharing your piece in the Globe and Mail. We're talking to Omar Mualim, his piece, The Gratitude Gap. What does Canada owe refugees? What do they owe us? Uh, this, this, I think I can call it a friendship, right? This relationship that you forged with a man by that we see him there, uh, uh, Jamal El Brahim. Is that how you pronounce Jamal. it? Um, yeah. You, you were, uh, yeah. you were. Uh, I mean, in particular, there's a thousand ways we could uh, approach 
uh, this relationship that you've you've built with this man over the past six or seven years. But what I was particularly almost not amused by, but a smile crept across my face as you shared how surprised you were to hear of his political leanings uh, as, as, a, as a relatively new but certainly settled Canadian. As you said, he had been mortgaged. He had been employed. He was now settled into life here in Canada. You were surprised that he told you that he would vote conservative. Take us into that understanding. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this, you know, at this point, I, I knew that I wanted to write this story. And I and I actually, you know, I wanted to talk to him about this topic. Um, but when we met in October of 2019, when we met at a, at a cafe, um, it just so happened that we were sort of in swing of the uh, of the election. And just to he hadn't written his citizenship test, he was about to. Um, so he couldn't vote. But I just asked as a hypothetical if you could vote, who would you vote for? And I, I was very, very confident he was going to say the Liberal Party because his family literally would not be here if it wasn't for Justin Trudeau's uh, campaign commitment to resettle 25,000 refugees. They they came to Canada within months of that. They were in, in asylum limbo in, Can- in Lebanon for two years. And then, uh, you know, the Liberals won the, the majority. Uh, the majority and this is in 2015 and then they were here almost right away so it's, it did surprise me you know i mean i come from a family of lebanese immigrants who are staunch liberal voters and that is a uh, in large part because of their commitment uh to you know trudeau senior and his multicultural policies that made their um settlement here um possible so but you know jamal is uh jamal's a great dude he's um in some ways i, I feel like he's He's more true Albertan than I am when I when he said he would vote conservative and he saw my surprised expression. He was like, look, I'm an economy guy, (laughs) like spoken like a true Albertan. And he is. I mean, he works in the oil and gas industry. He worked in the oil and gas industry in uh, in Syria as well. Um, So maybe it, it, it shouldn't have surprised me. He was he's in the right place you know, for, for his profession. Um, but it did. And, and I think that's, that's sort of what made me think about, okay, so what did I just assume there? I assumed that he was going to vote for the liberal party because he, because he feels like he owes them that, that he owes them his second life, that his family owes them that. Uh, I, I assumed that the liberal, that Trudeau had two supporters from him and his wife because uh, because of their resettlement here. And I, and I was wrong. And that's a, it's a very troubling assumption, actually, is to just assume people have to have certain political values because of where they came and what their circumstances are. That's no different than assuming people are going to have certain social values or not be able to adopt certain values because of where they're from and what their circumstances are. So let's bring this back to the, the question that you ask. And I, and I think the challenge that you get every single one of your readers uh, to wrestle with, which is what does Canada owe refugees? What do refugees owe us? Um, and you talk about, you know, in Canada, an average of about 25,000 refugees that have been resettled per year since 2015. And, and the federal government's plan to nearly double its 2021 goal by accepting 45,000 protected persons, as you write, asylum seekers currently in the country. You feel, and, and, and I know that you've already made this clear, but just to reiterate, the sense, I mean, I mean, the the sort of general sense, or at least one that I feel like I've been privy to, is that Canada is doing a just a huge favor that we're out of the goodness of our heart. We're opening up our borders to, to twenty five thousand. Not too many. Right. Because as, as we've read on all the far right wing sites, um, every problem in Germany is is attributable to a million asylum seekers in Germany. Right. We, we all we all understand that that Germany had no problems before asylum seekers showed up. Right. And out of the goodness of our hearts here in Canada, we're going to dial back that number. But we will allow twenty five thousand to trickle in because we're Canadians and because we're so kind and we're seeing the world over as just being the best as God's gift to the rest of planet Earth. Right. But but I want you to put a challenge in front of us on how to reimagine or re-understand or reprocess the role of accepting refugees, of the immigration process, and of the idea of, of welcoming new Canadians. I mean, how would you like, what would the lens adjustment look so like? We need to, I want to take you and listeners into a time portal, and we're going to go to 2050. This is just one generation from now. 
currently there are 80 million refugees. Um, that's double the amount of European refugees left in World War II. Um, by some measurements, this is the most number of displaced people on this planet ever. In 2050, that number most likely will be at least 200 million. That's in 30 years. Um, some numbers run as high as a billion, but let's the most off recited number is 200 million. Let's go with that. Where are they coming from? Um, they are coming still from the global south, but also um, specifically the southwestern hemisphere, that is Central and Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, and a large part of that is because of uh, the climate crisis, which we were, your, we were talking about today on your show. Um, so where are those people going to go? Where, like, are they, are they supposed to cross the sea and go to Europe? Africa? Are they all just going to, you know, go inland into South America? You also have to think about drought. You have to think about sustenance scarcity. Um, all the things that are going to come with the, uh, with the, with climate refugees or with, with climate displacement rather. No, I mean, most likely they're going to want to settle in the United States and Canada. Now, just wanting to doesn't necessarily um, mean that we are on the hook for that, but we have to now look at uh, what, you know, what do we have to do with the carbon emissions that have, ex that have expedited and help cause the climate crisis um, and the floods and the droughts that are displacing people. Um, maybe that means that as Canada is, Canadians are um, by a lot of, you know, by, by some uh, measures, the biggest polluters in the world on an individual level, that maybe that means that it is a question of justice that we should have to resettle uh, Latin American, Caribbean, and Central American refugees in Canada because we owe them that, because this is reparations for what we did to the planet. That's, that's one way to look at it. And then you also have to consider, too, that, ref, that due to the climate crisis and climate displacement, it's not just going to be south like the southern hemisphere a lot of people due to say wildfires we're seeing that right now um, in north america are going to be displaced as well and so they may not be able to go home now they may not have to go to the united states um, but they may have to go to the next province over or the next city over and we could have a, a wave of displaced people say from fort mcmurray like we had in 2016 but here for the long term for some reason, they can't go back. So what are the terms of that relationship going to be like? You know, both me as someone who's in sort of the host community and they as someone who's being hosted, what do we owe each other? What are our expectations? Because if we expect something more from them that they can't deliver and they expect more from us that we can't deliver, that breeds resentment between the two in that relationship. And you take that to a national and international level and you could have uh, a real international crisis, a real, real problem, bigger than what we're seeing right now. Do you think you could get, uh, I mean, I know the, the role of any great op-ed or the any great, I'm, I would almost call yours an essay in the Globe. It's a longer form piece. I wouldn't call it an essay. I wouldn't call it an op-ed, yeah, to be it, completely it, honest it, it's with It's an you. essay. It's an essay. I don't uh, have any, you know, super sharp opinions well, um, in mean, it, really. It's, it's about balancing, you know, a lot of different opinions in there. Yeah, yeah that's a fair point. Um, I was going to say maybe you could just even sell it as I, it's not my opinion. It's just the truth, uh, which is how I might Let's sell half of the polemic. things. I, <laughs> yeah. But but you know that, I mean, the, the role of a, of a great essay like that will get people taught. I mean, here you are and you're going to have thousands of people talking about this today. I'm excited for people to hear this on the podcast. Um, Inshallah. But but I yeah, but I but but Omar, I, I I honestly I mean, I look at you, you invoke, you know, the, the subject matter around climate change. And this isn't everybody. It's not everybody. But when we talk to Canadians about, you know, the oil sands or when we talk about, you know, as a as a developed nation or a G7 nation or whatever, people oftentimes many people will push back and say Canada's emissions are negligible. You know, don't talk to me about carbon tax or don't talk to me about keeping the oil in the ground until we talk to China and India and all of the big polluters. Canada is not the problem. Our global emissions are fewer than 2%. That to me indicates that what you're talking about, 
this sort of sense of responsibility, of reparation, of taking responsibility for contributions to things like climate change might be a tough sell for a lot of people. Oh, absolutely. It's a tough sell. Absolutely. It's a tough sell. And, and I mean, that therein lies the problem, right? I mean, that's, it is a, I mean, just dealing with climate change is a tough sell, right? And we've seen how far and how difficult that has been. Um, this one is an extremely tough sell. Now, it, it is interesting, though, that I mean, th- that are that there's logic in that argument. But at the same time, you know, say Canadian emissions are less than 2% or of, of global emissions. But our population is much, 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 much less than 2% of the global population. So we I mean, we are disproportionate um, you know, polluters. And so, I mean, I feel like that, that has to be worth something, right? Omar, hang tight for a second. I want to, I want to get into the flip side of this argument too. I want to talk to you about Canadian values and Canadian culture and refugees. O Canada right now, quickly friends, I want to turn your attention uh, to the sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com. If you look there, you can see, of course, all of the sponsors that team up with us to make sure that we can continue to host conversations like this one with Omar and with the guests before him. I mean, our 150th episode today, by the way, thank you to all of our partners that have made the first 150 so successful. It includes the team at Campers Village. So at ryanjesperson.com, you click on sponsors. You'll find Campers Village there. If you click the link, you're going to see it'll take you right to their summer sale. It's running through till July 11th, which means you only have a few days left, up to 40% off top outdoor gear. If you're like me, there's always something that you could replace or upgrade, or at least you're always looking for an excuse to replace or upgrade your camping or hiking gear. I'm always looking for the latest in these inflatable, super ultra lightweight mattresses you know those little inflatables nothing like a fabulous mattress that's my jam my buddy laws huge on the newest technology in sleeping bags you get other people that'll be paying attention to buyer's guides every year for the best in backpacking boots or maybe it's just the campground footwear your sandals what have you they've got it all at campers village and right now up to 40 percent off as part of their summer sale you can find them online click the sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com also a big shout out to the team at westworld computers they have a fully authorized apple service department they're trained technicians more than 40 years of experience can upgrade or fix any apple product your mac your ipad your apple watch your iphone whatever it is you can book your appointment for service on their website westworld.ca or link to it through ours or you can call one of their apple service advisors find the number on the website you can park right in front of the store you can walk right in forget about those big long lines or working your way through the big malls to find service at those big box stores you know the one i'm talking about if you're big on apple go to westworld computers and a shout out to the team at park power i've been really enjoying their website as of late i've been telling you one of the big reasons why we reached out to Park Power. We told them we wanted to partner with them. It's because we love how they approach community. You can find this at parkpower.ca, a list of their community partners. Now, why is this important or relevant to you? Because Park Power donates 10% of its electricity profits to local charities. And you get to choose which charity off their list you'd like to support just by signing up. So whether it's the Altview Foundation for Gender Variant and Sexual Minorities, whether it's the Boys and Girls Club of Strathcona County, whether it's Muscular Dystrophy Canada, whether it's the Saffron Center or others, you choose where the profits, 10% of them from your electricity bill are going to go. Make sure when you take your business to Park Power, you use the promo code 2021-REALTALK for $70. Yeah, $70 off your first bill. That's 2021-REALTALK at parkpower.ca. Omar Muellam is our guest, a journalist, an author, a good friend of this show. He's got a book out September 21st. Looking forward to that, Praying to the West, and we'll get to that in just a moment. But but Omar, let me ask you, when it comes to what Canada owes refugees, what refugees owe Canada, you'll oftentimes hear people talk about Canadian values, talk about Canadian culture. And if I were to think of an, an example of where somebody may may, you know, sort of express disillusionment with somebody falling short, a refugee, an immigrant or otherwise falling short in what they owe Canada. It might be something along the lines of, hey, speak English, 
speak English. You hear people say stuff like this. What are refugees owe Canada? Well, that, I mean, that is that's a very tangible question that actually only recently there's been, you know, a sincere effort to really answer that. Uh, most like most of the rules around refugee resettlement come from uh, 1951, uh, the U.N. Convention 1951 and the 1967 protocol. Um, but recently there were uh, there was a U.N. agency that actually in the midst of this crisis tried to try to find an answer to that. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things that they, they came up with is that refugees have to make a sincere effort um, to understand the laws um, of the host nation, follow them, um, and to also uh, to apply for residency. They can't just, you know, linger around with uh, aimlessly um, if they, you know, if they are sincere about wanting to stay there and that they have to um, adhere to certain integration programs such as like English second language or French as second language that we have in Canada. Um, but there's also, you know, there's some uh, political philosophers and moral philosophers who say that refugees don't actually even owe us that much, that um, they don't necessarily have to, uh, or shouldn't be expected rather, to follow the lands of the law if they don't you know, know them, that they can only be causally responsible for breaking laws that they do not know, but not morally responsible for, uh, for that. Um, the, I mean, the, the the question of values is is a really interesting one. You know, people will say, well, yes, of course, they have to follow, uh, adopt Canadian values or make an effort to anyway. But what are Canadian values? What are values? Values are very fluid. They are fluid on a personal level and they're fluid on a national level. I don't carry the same. I don't have. Uh, the same values that I had, you know, 10 or 20 years ago, and I probably won't in 20 years. And Canada also doesn't exhibit the same values that it did, you know, a generation, two generations ago. I mean, two generations ago it was a mainstream Canadian value to forcibly snatch up Indigenous kids and force them into residential schools and force them to adapt to Christian, uh, to, you know, the Christian religions um, and to Christian values. Um, so I don't know how much stake we want to really put into this this idea of Canadian values when we know it is fluid. But let's say we do. Right now, the thing to, to remember is that, you know, you can't you can't expect people to just check their customs and their values at the border as soon as they come across. It is a it is a um, process. Right. Adopting Canadian values is a process. And often what happens in, in immigrant families is that the children, the second generation Canadians are the ones who actually um, start to change their parents' values or to you know, westernize or Canadianize their values more than maybe they had before. Um, you know, what, what I've seen in my community a lot is a lot of the, you know, the discomfort around um, same-sex marriage or homosexuality in general is starting to change as millennials and Gen Z, you know, uh, second generation Canadians or Muslim Canadians um, start to, you know, sort of uh, impose or sort of impress these values onto the parents. And I see this with my own parents who have, I think, become much more uh, pluralistic, much more um, kind of progressive because they are actually responding to, you know, the way to the challenges that their children um, bring to their lives and they adopt to that and they adjust to that. And, and that's when you start to see them, um, you know, maybe adopt more comfort with Western customs um, or values than maybe they had before. It is it's a process. It happens over the course of people's lives and it happens over generations. Um, and we we all know that we all know that. But I think that when you're not from an immigrant community, it's hard for you to really understand just how fluid values are. Because when you're in an immigrant community, you see them changing all the time. I, I always try to think of it. <laughs> I feel like I offer this caveat 10 times a show where I say, you know, warning, this is hardly profound. But I imagine if my family were to have been displaced for whatever reason uh, and, and my parents were to have moved us to Syria or to Pakistan or to Lebanon or to Somalia or wherever, and I try to walk a mile in those shoes where I wonder 
would I probably still speak English with my family members? Would I probably still speak English in, uh, in the home if I were riding public transit or walking down the street with my brother or with my wife or my son? Would I probably still speak English? Maybe my son would be a bad example because he'd probably be picking up the native language quickly and would probably be helping me learn it. But you have yeah. to put yourself in the other position and you have to understand probably how would you would you? Uh, you know, uh, w- would you abandon all religious conviction and, and move to the more mainstream religion, if that's even such a thing? I mean, of course not. Obviously not. No. Would you still have a hankering for for ribs or cheeseburgers or tacos? Or would you automatically drop all of your culinary preferences and only eat the food rooted in the culture to where you've moved? I mean, obviously you would not. These are hypothet- these are these are almost rhetorical questions, right? But here, when I talk about Canada, for a lot of people, it seems lost. Yeah. I, I mean the the, th- <laughs> the thing is you you probably would um, you know, if your if your family um you know was displaced and the only place that you uh could find, you know, uh, refuge was Syria, um, I imagine that just for the sake of survival and making your life easier, you would actually probably start picking up Arabic and making an effort I'd to be trying and you make probably, an effort, sure. you probably, I probably would see, you know, uh, Ryan and Carrie and Wyatt outside the shawarma stand, uh, you know, <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> because, I'd be there, Omar, you know, I'd be there. Oh, I know you'd be there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, 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 you know, um, what? But, but seriously, Omar, yeah, but, yeah, no, down- I, I come I'm sorry to step on your toes, but it, it, it's it's that whole idea. It, it's yeah. I mean, I, I'm about to here we go. Open up the can. But it's that whole thing around make America great again. It's the whole thing around people's recollection of, of the United States or of Canada or Alberta or wherever they are that did not include or that that, that, did, that was not as diverse. It was like in, in many people's understanding or many people's recollection. It was the so-called good old days. But it wasn't great for everybody. Yeah. And I think that there's, you know, for a lot of people, that's where they're most comfortable. And anything that evolves or changes from there is then perceived as problematic. But it's it's human nature, right? I mean, like, I <laughs> can't believe I'm saying this, but we shouldn't be singling out just the English or Western, you know, English speaking world here. Um, the You know, these discomforts and these expectations and these pressures they are true um, you know they are true of Ethiopian refugees in Kenya they are true of Syrian refugees in Turkey um, this is just human nature and so I mean what I wanted to do with this story is not actually write a policy piece I wanted to write an, an ethical piece and write something that whether you're Canadian or not um, you can uh, understand as a as a human um, and start to kind of weigh what are the human obligations that we have to each other? What do we owe each other? Before we thank you for your time, we've already taken you way into overtime, but something tells me you don't mind. I hope not. I hope I haven't yeah, screwed I'm, I'm up. Happy to be here, man. I hope I haven't screwed up your entire day's schedule. Um, I'd love to get yeah. you back and and talk about your book, Praying to the West, uh, because that's an entirely well, maybe it maybe maybe it, it it's Congress with what we're talking about here, um, but but an entirely different and interesting focus, Praying to the West, how Muslims shaped the Americas. Can can you tee up for us the premise of this book? How did sure. Muslims shape the Americas? Well, people forget that, um, you know, some of the first enslaved Africans were Muslims, that some of the, uh, you know, some of the people that came with Columbus to the West were um, Moriscos, you know, they were former Moors, they were former Muslims um, converted, you know, to forced to convert to Christianity um, during the Reconquista. A lot of them still held uh, Muslim values are even practiced Islam in secrecy. Um, so that is to say that Islam is as old in the West as any non-indigenous faith. And it has always been here. It's always been a part of uh, the West of Western history. And yet it's been forgotten, erased, overlooked. And so I wanted to recover it. But I also wanted to do it in a way that looks at Muslim communities now. Um, and so I traveled um, almost 10,000 miles, uh, not all at once, uh, from from uh, Brazil up to the Arctic, going to 13 distinct mosques 
and meeting those communities and understanding how they uh, how they ended up there, the impact that they had on the region, the impact that the regions had on them, um, and also how it all ties into this this 500 year history of Islam in the West. Um, and so that's what I hope to do. And it it didn't start off as a personal journey, but it started to become one uh, very quickly as uh, someone who grew up in a Muslim household um, and who has a very complicated relationship with the with the faith. Um, it forced me to sort of um, come to terms and reconcile with my religious heritage and the ways that it has shaped me, whether I like it or not. I can't wait to read it. I note that you're taking pre-orders right now, so I want to refer people to Praying to the West. Dot com. That's where you can read about Omar's uh, travel log. Very cool. And you can order your pre-sale uh, today. I'm going to read the postcard from Jerusalem when we sign off. I haven't read that one yet, Omar. It's such a pleasure to connect with you. It's been kind of strange. Typically, you and I, our, pa- our paths cross in person. I'm going to tell everybody the way that it always is. I'm always out wearing like baggy shorts and a hoodie and sunglasses out for a slow walk. And you're always the guy with those exact earphones in running and exercising and pursuing fitness goals and 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 every single time I go, gosh, I got to go running with Omar one day. Uh, it's it, it's so nice to run with <laughs> you in it. a sense here. Yeah, no, I know. This is what I do is I, I make a statement like that and then I pull back before you can actually commit. Yeah, I'm, me. I'm holding you to it. Yeah, man. I'm holding you to it. <laughs> uh, much love, Omar. So good to see you. Congratulations in advance on the book. It's out September 21st. You. Loved your piece. People can read it. Globe and mail dot com as well. And it's wonderful to have you here on Real Talk on our 150th episode. Thank you for this. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. You bet. That's Omar Mualam. Uh, you can find him online. Um, everybody calls him two AOK, right? Omar's got like this this really great sort of side hustle, great with music. And he's in, in, <laughs> I don't know. I did think you he, see that? I feel like he's trying to like when he signed in. You see, someone's like AOK. I love that guy. It used <laughs> to be his Twitter guy. handle. Yeah, yeah he's Omar be, AOK. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. he's that. Uh, He's gone professional. You can find him now yeah, he's at like, Omar Mualam. Yeah. So there he Let's is. Let's not talk about the rap career. Come yeah. On. I got, I had somebody, uh, it, was, it was kind of funny the other day. Somebody sent me and said, hey, just an FYI, here's my new yeah. email account. Right. And I was like, oh, congratulations. You're like 38 years old and you're no longer like schmitzy69 at hotmail.com. It's like people are like applying for jobs with these email addresses. I'm going, oh my gosh, that's not Omar. I'm not saying Omar. What was your first email address? Rexyboy at hotmail.com. Rexy boy. Rexy boy. There's a Was long story there. Was there a drum there Heller reference in there? Oh, nice try. No, uh, not nice try, but no, no, no good. <laughs> nice good, try, Hoyles. <laughs> nice try, Hoyles. Try. Eh. No, it was. Uh, that was this weird thing for in university for several years. I, I earned the nickname Rex. Like, just, are your it's, arms it's, it's a, smaller? It's a big. Yeah, I was trying to clap and they could see me and I couldn't quite. Like I couldn't T-Rex. quite get them there. T Rex. Uh, no, and so Rexy boy was the very first one. What I do here. Hard swerve Ooh. to let you know that the team at Friesen Brothers, they've got bees on the roof. They've got bees on the roof. But don't worry, they're outside and it's in a good way. They're brand new, relatively brand new Edmonton location. Can you believe they've been open two months already wow. in South Edmonton? I know that so many real talkers that are in the south side of the city. Forget about that. As a matter of fact, real talkers in in Nisku and Leduc and Camrose and Fort Saskatchewan. Well, Fort Saskatchewan's got their own. Stony Plains got their own. But I would say that the folks that are that are maybe in um, where else do I want to say Beaumont, Morinville. Uh, have I said Camrose yet? Oh, everybody that's making the trip into Friesen Brothers in South Edmonton, you know, I don't have to tell you why you're doing it. It's because it's compl- people don't even remember what their old grocery store looks like anymore. It's so dramatically different, including bees on the roof at Friesen Brothers Rabbit Hill Road location. What does this mean? It means local fresh honey. Like it doesn't get more local than that. It's part of the game. It's part of their entire platform. For more than 65 years, Friesen Brothers has been Alberta grown and Alberta owned. It it is heat up the grill season. Don't forget to check out their exclusive Ivan's sausages. Those are made by their in-store butchers. Those come with the Jespo recommendation. The team at Eden Landscaping invites you to check them out online at landscapeedmonton.ca. We always let you know about the web addresses, but keep in mind you can find them all under the sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com. This is how you can learn more. You can see what Eden Landscaping has been doing over the past two decades as a custom landscape 
builder bringing outdoor spaces to life. For me, the dream is the outdoor kitchen. For you, it might be the big swim spa, maybe a beautiful retaining wall with planters built in. Whatever you can dream, they can build it. Their design team, ready to rock right now. You can find them online at landscapeedmonton.ca. And a shout out to the team at Grand Dog Essentials Quality Raw Food. One of the things I love about their website at granddog.ca, they have a blog. You can find it right across the top. Click on blog. You can read about camping with your raw fed dog you can read about how some of their customers have discovered that raw food is the answer to a happy healthy life for their dogs even on safety tips or things like how to transition your pup to a raw diet plus many of the frequently asked questions around raw food a reminder with the promo code real talk at granddog.ca they'll take 10 percent off your first time order i can't believe that it's Friday tomorrow. I can't believe that we're getting ready to wrap up our broadcast week. Want to let you know we've got a great Real Talk roundtable in store coming up Friday. That'll be live at 9 o'clock Mountain, 11 o'clock Eastern. What does economic recovery from COVID look like across Canada? We're going to talk to some of Canada's foremost business experts. Plus, we're going to dig into other stories like how to identify the true from the false online. All the tools you need. We'll see you then.